kontor gitu. Okay, this is the July 10th meeting of the Open Space and Ecology Committee. We're set up a little bit differently because this is going to be the training session for um, the EIR review. Um, as, 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 as with previous training sessions, we have been fortunate to um, have with us uh, Terry Rivas Plata. Um, who is the technical director with the firm of ICF International. Um, Mr. Rivas Plata is an expert in issues of uh, EIRs, general plans, and probably a few other areas. Um, I think his, I think anybody who's watching this um, broadcast would know that uh, he's done a fabulous job uh, with the secret training um, for the general public and for the BBCAG and for the uh, um, Parks and Recreation Commission. And we welcome him again and thank him for being so forthright and <laughs> um, about the prospects for getting a great EIR here. Okay, well, thanks very much. So uh, today we're going to talk about CEQA. If you've watched any of the uh, previous sessions, uh, we're going to go over the same stuff to a certain extent, but then we'll also open it up for questions and answers so that uh, members of the committee will have a chance to ask me. And hopefully I can answer, but ask me uh, their, their uh, pointed questions about the whole process and uh, how what they do links into CEQA. So we'll just jump off uh, into the world of CEQA here real quick. Nice picture. Okay, so CEQA in 25 words or less. It's a 1970 law, so it's an old law. Uh, it was originally intended or is intended to uh, uh, be sort of an environmental backstop for decision making. Uh, it requires that agencies consider the potential impacts of their projects that they undertake and that they look before they leap before they actually approve a project. Uh, when it was passed in 1970, it was originally intended to apply only to public projects. Uh, but as time went by in 1972, there was a lawsuit that was heard by the California Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court interpreted CEQA as actually applying to all public actions. So not just public agency projects, but things that public agencies are approving as well. So that meant subdivisions, specific plans, uh, zone changes, all of those things suddenly came under CEQA's realm. So since about 1972, uh, CEQA has been this sort of all-encompassing uh, law that requires documentation of a project's potential impacts disclosure of that to the public, and then consideration of those things by the public agencies before they make their decision. Uh, it is a magnet, oops, hey, come back here. Uh, it's a magnet for land use litigation uh, because it offers an easy route uh, into litigation. It's relatively simple uh, for people who want to sue a city or a county or some other public agency. Um, and if you look at the court cases that are considered every year and, and end up being published by the various courts here in the state, uh, there are usually 20, 25, 30 cases on land use issues, and usually 80 or 90 percent of them involve some CEQA challenge. So uh, it's probably the most popular means of challenging uh, actions by cities as it's, turned to, uh, as it's come about. So CEQA's guiding policies, it's basically disclosure, 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 just like we say re uh, location, location, location if we're a real estate agent. Uh, it discloses to decision makers what the impacts of a project might be, how to kind of go about avoiding those impacts, what mitigation measures they might apply. Uh, it identifies ways to avoid these damages. Uh, it attempts to prevent environmental damage to the extent that it can. Uh, it discloses to the public the potential impacts of a project and allows them to take part in the process. And then it also discloses to other agencies what this particular agency is up to and what the potential impacts of that project might be. So those other agencies can weigh in and offer their advice to. So what CEQA isn't, CEQA is not a permit. CEQA is a process. So at the end of the CEQA process, you aren't given an approval or a denial of a project. You simply are given 
a bunch of information about the project, what the project's impacts might be, uh, how to go about minimizing those impacts, uh, whether there are any impacts that can't be avoided. Uh, all of those things come out of the CEQA process. Uh, it by itself doesn't prescribe any development standards. You can seek, seek high and low throughout the CEQA statute and uh, throughout the CEQA guidelines, and it won't tell you straight out that this is acceptable or that is acceptable. We can do this, we can't do that. Uh, it doesn't have any development standards. It doesn't prescribe acceptable levels of risk, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of historic resources. But for the most part, it doesn't say, you know, this particular sort of action is going to be risky and we require you to do this or do that. It doesn't do that. And then it doesn't specify the regulations that a project has to follow. It's assumed, and it actually does occur, that a project is going to be subject to all the regulations that exist at the time that it's approved. Uh, but CEQA doesn't say that. Uh, it also doesn't prescribe the study methods that are used. So it leaves a lot of um, flexibility for the agencies that are undertaking these CEQA reviews to fill in all of these blanks. What are the development standards we're going to apply to the project? Well, we'll use the ones that our city has adopted as ordinance or as regulations. Uh, what are the acceptable levels of risk? Well, we, the city, are going to determine, based on the type of project it is, what's acceptable to us. Uh, what regulations do they have to follow? Well, we're going to insist that they follow federal and state regulations, of course, and we may have some local ones as well that they'll have to follow. And then study methods, just like risk, uh, what are the professionally accepted methods that we use to study the potential impacts of this project? We're going to require that the applicant uh, do that, provide us with that information, or we're going to hire a consultant that will prepare that information for us. So CEQA does require analysis and disclosure of the potential impacts from a project, requires that uh, whenever it's feasible that mitigation measures have to be adopted and implemented as part of the project approval. Uh, and then it provides for this public process of looking at the project, discussing what the potential impacts might be, and then finally the decision makers, the city council, deciding whether to approve or disapprove the project. And if they approve it, what conditions they need to put on it in order to control its potential impacts. Uh, CEQA puts most of the responsibility for its implementation in the hands of a lead agency. In this case, it would be the city of Brisbane. Uh, they get to call practically all of the shots with re relation to CEQA. So they get to determine what might be significant, what might be less than significant, uh, what are good mitigation measures. Uh, as we'll talk about in a little while, they'll, they get to describe um, what are going to be the range of alternatives that the environmental impact report looks at. Uh, they'll determine uh, the level of detail that the particular alternatives are looked at. Uh, all of those things fall into the hands of the lead agency. Now, over the years, uh, some people have asked whether or not that sort of thing is a conflict of interest, particularly where a lead agency is undertaking its own project. Uh, for example, let's say the city of Sacramento, where I live, uh, building a downtown arena. Uh, the city wants to build a downtown arena or a new convention center. Uh, isn't it a conflict of interest that the city of Sacramento is doing the environmental impact report for their own convention center? And CEQA is held, no, it isn't. CEQA was written in a way that uh, it requires lead agencies to do these environmental documents and take responsibility for them for the projects that the agencies are looking at. So a city, if it was the city of Sacramento undertaking the convention center project, they're required to do the best they can to disclose what the impacts might be. And that EIR that they do is their EIR. So if someone is sued over it, if litigation occurs, uh, it's going to be a suit against the city. And that's the thing that's intended to keep cities and counties and other agencies honest is this potential for litigation and the potential for having to take responsibility to defend themselves uh, if they end up in litigation. OK, so environmental impact reports. Um, lead agency is responsible for pre preparing the environmental impact report. Uh, the environmental impact report, as you know, is uh, essentially a description of what the project is, what its objectives are, uh, what alternatives there might be to the project that would potentially reduce its impacts and meet most or all of its objectives. Uh, what kind of impacts might come out of this project, what the environmental setting is or what the area is currently, what the area might look like when the project is, is implemented, uh, disclose what the potential impacts might be and how they can be avoided. All of those things go into an EIR. So as I mentioned, the lead agency, the city, gets to make the decisions as to what goes into it with this idea that they have to follow what CEQA says. Uh, they would potentially be liable if there's a lawsuit, and that keeps them honest. And then the city council is required to actually certify that the EIR is adequate for this purpose. It, it's good enough to cover the potential impacts of the project. Uh, we, the council, have looked at it before we make our decision. Uh, and it, it uh, represents our independent judgment as to what goes into this thing. 
So uh, lead agency is responsible for preparing the EIR, but that means that they can do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, in some places, not Brisbane, but in some places, uh, city councils have gone so far as to let the applicant actually prepare, or their consultant actually prepare an administrative draft of the EIR, and then the city reviews that and goes forward from there. Uh, more commonly is what Brisbane is doing is they hire a third-party consultant who prepares the environmental document on the behalf of the city, and then the city reviews that so that it re reflects their independent judgment, and then goes forward with the draft EIR, and et cetera, et cetera, with the help of the consultant. Uh, we also have some, oh, yes, question. Oh, sure. Yeah, feel free. Because this is a question I had also last night when I looked at the Okay, we'll get you the microphone on you and then you can pose your question. Sorry, I had a question about this part where it says limited exceptions to this rule. Right. And I was curious what agents, and then also each agency is responsible for imposing mitigation uh, within its own powers. Right. The so the responsible agencies are those agencies that also have permitting power over the project. Right. So here it would be, um, you know, Department of Toxic Substances Control, uh, the county, because I guess the county has uh, regulations relating to the landfill and its remediation. Uh, it would be uh, who are the, the Regional Water Board. Uh -huh. So those are three just offhand that would be responsible agencies. And so uh, they're obligated to use the EIR that the city certifies, meaning that when it comes time for their decision, uh, they have to base their decision on the environmental impact report the city has done. Now there's some limited exceptions to that. And the exceptions are, number one, if they disagree with the EIR, uh, they could, within the statute of limitations, sue the city and allege that we think that this EIR is inadequate for these particular reasons, and so therefore we're not going to use it. But they have to sue the city in order to be able to do that. Uh, the other exception is if they decide, after looking at the project and what's happened since the EIR was certified by the city council, they determine that there is new information or changes in the project, modifications to the project, uh, or changes in the circumstances surrounding the project that indicate that there would be either a new impact or a more severe impact that wasn't covered in the original EIR, then they can go about doing what's called a subsequent EIR. And that subsequent EIR would focus in on the new things. So it would be a smaller, usually a smaller scope than the original EIR and focusing in on those things that are new. So those are the limited exceptions, but other than that, uh, those agencies are obligated to use the same EIR that the city has prepared. And the idea is to streamline the CEQA process. CEQA is kind of a one project, one document process. The idea being that the lead agency is preparing this document and then all of the responsible agencies who are going to be responsible, I guess, for approving other permits for that same project will use that same environmental document. So you don't have a bunch of agencies each preparing their own document for the same project. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, lead agency isn't, is obligated to use the EIR, but they're not obligated to take the same action that the city does. So if the city approves the Baylands project, uh, any one or all of the other agencies could deny it if they, if they chose. They don't have to issue their permit. Um, they can also apply uh, additional conditions to their approval uh, if those conditions relate to regulations that they may have. Uh, or if there, are if there are conditions that would perhaps uh, provide some additional detail to the mitigation measures that the city has identified. Uh, so that's pretty much how that works. One project, one document. Lead agency does the document. Responsible agencies use the same one. And then with some limited exceptions, uh, they may be able to make modifications to the conditions of approval uh, or even do a subsequent EIR uh, if conditions warrant it. Subsequent EIR doesn't usually pop up. It doesn't happen very often if the decisions are relatively close together. So if the city approves the project and let's say six months later it comes before the regional board for their approval, chances are not much has changed in that period of time. Uh, and so usually you won't see a subsequent EIR done, particularly if it's a relatively short period of time. Uh, so how does an EIR influence decision makers? Well, the agencies are required to consider what's in the EIR before they take their action. Uh, they are, uh, let's see what else. We oh, I guess we have feasible mitigation has to be incorporated into the approval. The mitigation is identified in the EIR. Uh, and then the city council has to explain itself. Why are we approving this project if that's what they decide to do? Uh, so they adopt findings. And the findings essentially look at each one of the impacts that was identified in the EIR and offers a, the disposition of that impact. Uh, the three different findings that could be made. One is that 
uh, we're essentially we're going to be mitigating that particular impact. Uh, the other finding would potentially be that uh, mitigation of, of that impact is the responsibility of another agency, and they can and will undertake that mitigation. And then the third alternative would be uh, we're finding that this mitigation or this alternative is infeasible, and here are the particular reasons why. So when they make these findings, they not only have to describe the disposition of what happened with each of the impacts identified, but they have to provide what's called substantial evidence or factual evidence to support what they're saying. So it isn't uncommon at all for a findings document, uh, particularly on a big project, to be 80 pages, 100 pages. They can be pretty good sized documents in and of themselves because they're explaining in detail why the city approved it, what happened to the impacts that were identified in the EIR, and then providing evidence as to why that, you know, why those findings are made. Uh, there's also something called a statement of ob overriding considerations. An agency adopts a statement of override uh, if it approves a project that would have significant and unavoidable impacts. So as I mentioned before, CEQA doesn't require an agency to deny a project. It doesn't either approve or deny any project. So you can have projects that would have significant impacts that can't be avoided despite mitigation, and nonetheless the agency can go ahead and approve them. But if it does so, it has to prepare one of these statement of overriding considerations that explains what are the specific benefits of this project that outweigh the impacts. And the benefits would be things like uh, economic benefits, uh, there may be legal benefits, there may be technological benefits, uh, can be a whole variety of things that would potentially be a benefit to the community uh, that override the impacts of the project. And this, like the findings, has to be supported by factual evidence. And so again, the statement of override is going to be at least several pages long and have probably have citations to other documents to show, well, this is why we're doing it. If it's for economic purposes, uh, perhaps the city will prepare an economic study or cite um, uh, instances where this is going to provide jobs or employment uh, or some other economic benefit to the city. Uh, if it's legal, well, maybe this is helping the city meet its housing element requirements in its general plan or something like that. Uh, so the city has to explain why it's approving the project uh, and provide evidence of that. Okay, so program EIRs, the EIR that's being prepared for the Baylands is something called a program EIR. That means it's an EIR that is being prepared uh, with the understanding that this is going to be the first environmental document for this project, but it's a relatively large, complex project. It may be done in phases, has a number of responsible agencies that are going to be taking a actions on it later, and so it essentially creates a foundation for future environmental analyses. So this is uh, just kind of quickly lays out what sorts of things program EIRs can be used for. Uh, one thing to note is the level of detail in a program EIR is commensurate with the, the project's level of detail. So the things that are known today are going to be reflected in the program EIR. Uh, so things that are known in detail about the project will be reflected in relative detail in the program EIR. Things that may be in later phases or are not very well known will be discussed in more general terms in the program EIR. Program EIR is, is required to look at all the potential impacts of the project. Can't put things off to the future. But some of them, if there's not very much known about them at this time, will be described in relatively general terms. It'll be relatively general analysis of those because there simply isn't information available. Question? What are the future risks of not having that clearly defined, um, like as closely as it should be? Pardon? Oh, oh, sorry. What, you mean the uh, project, not having the project clearly defined? Not having the project clearly defined and then the mitigations that may lack details. Ah. And so, like for instance, uh, say project's not defined about a certain aspect, then the mitigation might not be defined very well either and could then later kind of not be as closely watched or fall out. Right. Yeah, so uh, first off, the, if a project doesn't describe something very well, then that requires that when the subsequent analysis is done by the responsible agency, that they take a closer look at that, if, as that, as that information kind of pops to the surface. So if they're doing permitting and now they've done a study that provides more information about a particular aspect of the project, or it turns out that the remediation is going to take a different turn than we thought, perhaps. Uh, that means that the responsible agency will then have to take a look at that. And as we talked about the subsequent EIR, that would potentially be a requirement that would 
trigger a subsequent EIR, a subsequent negative declaration, it would zero in on that particular new aspect of the project. Because that would be, as I mentioned, a change in circumstances or a change in project, those sorts of things that trigger, or new information, things that trigger a subsequent EIR, that would fall into that category. And the mitigation measures, CEQA requires that a program EIR include mitigation measures for all the impacts it identifies. So if it has identified an impact for this area that's on, only known relatively generally, that mitigation measure has to be detailed enough to provide at least a framework for future mitigation measures to fill in. And that framework will be filled in when the responsible agencies come along, uh, review the analysis, find that, oh gosh, you know, this is uh, something that wasn't adequately covered, and then fill it in as they, as they cover that. So would you consider this an area of vulnerability? Uh, is it an area of vulnerability? Not necessarily. No, it, because of the fact that the program EIR is intended to provide detail about the things it knows now and less detail about the things it really doesn't know now. So it isn't necessarily an area of vulnerability. It's an area of vulnerability if the city doesn't uh, include mitigation measures, for example, for impacts that it identifies. Uh, or if the mitigation measures simply say, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to fix this problem, something like that. The mitigation measures have to be a commitment on the part of the city. Uh, they have to have what are called performance standards, which lay out uh, these are the things that are going to be done in general, and then leave the details for how they're going to be done to the future, and then provide some way of um, determining whether or not those things are, are going to be effective. So as long as the mitigation measures include those things, a commitment, performance standards, effectiveness, uh, they could be OK. Okay, there's been a number of court cases over the years on this, and cities have gotten into trouble where they've uh, not included mitigation measures. They know that there's an impact. They don't include mitigation measures. Uh, they've gotten into trouble where they've uh, known that there was an impact, didn't provide an analysis of the impact, and simply said, we're going to talk about that later. Uh, but not very many cities do that anymore. Not many EIRs do that anymore. It's pretty rare to see that. Those court cases date back to uh, probably the 90s, early 90s. Uh, so over time, you know, the practice gets better. And so it would be unusual for that to happen now. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. So as I mentioned, can oh, I, yeah. Can I just mm -hmm. follow up sure. on that a little bit? One of the things that we, we, we anticipate in the Baylands is that if the present landowner gets project gets a, a general approval, that they will then sell off pieces hmm. of, the, of, of the project. And it will be broken down into different owners and different responsible parties. So if you're talking about a mitigation measure that involves, say, um, providing a wildlife habitat mm -hmm. um, in general for areas that have been say for, for what were freshwater wetlands and don't exist anymore, okay, just. Then if later on, you know, somebody says, well, I'm going to build a building over here and I don't have to do any of that because the area I'm in doesn't affect the, you know, the, does, doesn't, didn't um, have any wetlands in it. And so I don't, I don't have to have a piece of that. I mean, what, what can you do to make sure that the subsequent owners, especially if there are more of them than there are now, um, don't um, try to weasel out of doing the mitigations that are required? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really something that CEQA is concerned about. But it, it's something that's important to how the city goes about approving the project. If, for example, the city uh, uh, approves a development agreement, for the, for the entire project. The development agreement will essentially run with the land. And so uh, as future developers come along, they'll be subject to it. Same thing with conditions of approval. If they have conditions of approval that apply to it, those would run with the land. Uh, also, any sorts of approvals that the city makes within uh, those areas would be subject to the same EIR and the same conditions of approval, same mitigation measures. So if someone can one want to subdivide a portion of the property, that EIR would be used for the subdivision. Those same mitigation measures would, would be uh, noted as part of the EIR and applied to the subdivision project. So there's a whole variety of ways that the city can go about implementing it. It's certainly something that take, the city should take into consideration when it's crafting its mitigation measures. So that it's writing mitigation measures that are 
pretty clear uh, and that can, uh, can clearly be applied to a variety of different potential property owners. And that will easily be implemented uh, through a variety of different ways in the various approvals that the city makes. And John, you wanted to add to that? Well, Terry, maybe you want to sort of get into the concept of a nexus with the mitigation measure when you're talking about sort of impacts that occur here and mitigation being required there. I don't know if you want to kind of... Maybe right, yeah, that's another thing, that. too. You happen to mention that, uh, you know, what if a developer owns one portion of a project and mitigation is actually applied somewhere else? Um, that's one thing the city needs, needs to take into account is they're applying these mitigation measures everywhere within, within the project site. And when they have property owners that are in one particular location, there may not be a connection between the impacts at that particular location and the mitigation measure that's required somewhere else. So the city's approvals and also the way that the environmental impact report will be applied to approvals in the future will kind of take that into account. One of the things that the city will need to be sure of or take, you know, take uh, precautions against is that uh, they don't have particular areas of the project uh, coming through for approval first if it, if it splits up into a variety of owners uh, and not being able to get mitigation for other portions of the project that temporarily need to be mitigated at the same point in time. So that isn't really CEQA, but it's something that the city, I'm sure, will take into account as they're putting together their approval and their conditions of approval uh, any sort of development agreements, uh, all of those sorts of things. So it's not really CEQA. It's important to CEQA because we want to make sure the mitigation measures are implemented. But it's not necessarily a CEQA requirement. It more or less rests on the approvals that the city is going to make based on the CEQA document. That's the way I look at it anyway. So just to drill down a little bit more, say that you have, you have something like this and you've set up mitigation um, requirements. And Ten years down the road, you find out that those mitigation um, methods are dysfunctional and don't work. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Right, so then what happens? Uh, mitigation measures don't work. We find out ten years from now. Uh, it depends on whether or not the city has any additional discretionary actions or whether there's some other public agency that has discretionary actions over the project. If there aren't, and discretionary actions mean uh, permits, uh, licenses, those sorts of things that have to be approved for the project to go forward or some portion of it to go forward. If they don't, there's no CEQA hook there. And so CEQA wouldn't require that you go back and uh, look at the mitigation and upgrade it or anything like that. CEQA is in some ways, CEQA is kind of a pick, uh, you know, point in time process. The EIR is done. There's a point in time when it's done. Those mitigation measures are essentially considered done at that point in time. And unless there's new information or changes in the project or changes in the circumstances that indicate that you need to bolster those, you know, or unless the project, uh, the responsible agencies have additional authority requirements that require them to bolster those, you don't necessarily go back and revisit the mitigation measures. CEQA is a funny process. It, once the EIR is done, it's kind of not put in a box, but it, it doesn't necessarily change. CEQA doesn't require that you go back and review the EIR every 10 years and upgrade it or anything like that. An EIR is just what it is. So, and I remember you saying this at a, at a previous training session mm -hmm. that, if, that, that CEQA doesn't require that mitigation measure, measures are effective. Um, it, but if the mitigation measures are couched in a performance standard, as a perf are expressed as a performance standard, you can ho you can hold the 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 landowner, whatever it is, the the party to that performance standard. Is that correct? Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why it's important when when the agency is putting together the mitigation measures to think about contingencies. You know, what's going to happen in 10 years? For things like uh, restoration, for example, um, you don't want to have a restoration mitigation measure that's two lines long. The, the, you know, the project shall uh, restore this marsh, period. You don't want to have something like that. It's going to be something that's much more detailed, uh, talking about the sorts of restoration that's going to go on, what the schedule of restoration might be, uh, contingencies. If the restoration doesn't follow the pattern we expect, then we're going to do this. If, uh, in, you know, if um, Within one year, it appears as though this isn't happening, we're going to do that. So contingencies are built into it. And performance standards, such as, uh, you know, we expect that within six months, we'll have 30% cover within 
a year there'll be 70% cover, uh, whatever it might be. I'm not a biologist. I'm just making this stuff up. But they would have these performance standards that would offer the city or give the city a way of actually going out there and determining whether or not this stuff, this stuff was working. And then after a period of time, if it appears it's not, contingency, meth, um, contingency provisions within the mitigation measure that say what happens if it doesn't work. It shall replant after five years if, this, if it's only reached this level of performance or whatever. So some of these mitigation measures, you know, we sometimes think of mitigation measures, we see them in an EIR and they're relatively short. It really depends on the particular resource that's being protected, the specific, particular impact that's occurring as to how long they are and then also how long a period of time is necessary in order to make sure that these things are working uh, kind of determines what the detail level is you're going to have and also what sorts of contingency measures you write in. Uh, writing mitigation measures is sometimes the hardest part uh, of the EIR because you don't always know what's going to happen in the future. So, yes? So for an example, say that there's toxic plume uh, under the Baylands mm -hmm. and there's mitigation measures that are in that they've begun or that their mitigation measures are to do X, Y, and Z. And if we do X, Y, and Z, then we will consider that mitigated and we can build houses there. Okay. So 10 years down the road, you find out, and, and they haven't finished building out, you know, and it's, the houses aren't there yet, but, but they've been put into the development agreement. All right. So then 10 years down the road, um, they're ready to start construction on those houses. But in the meanwhile, we found out that the mitigation efforts to alleviate the deleterious effect of the toxins isn't working. Mm -hmm. But the developer doesn't really care. Of course, we would hope they would care. But say they don't care because they're not going to live there and they want their money for building their houses and they've been given a development agreement and they've invested all this money so far mm -hmm. so they consider that they have vested rights. Well, what happens then? Do they get to build houses on an area that turns out the mitigation efforts didn't work and it's toxic? Yeah, in that example, no, because the, the decision wouldn't be up to the city. The decision on the toxics and those sorts of things would be up to the other regulatory agencies, uh, state and local agencies, of the regional board, for example, uh, the Toxic Substances Control Division, or department, I should say. Uh, and so the development agreement doesn't apply to those agencies. The development agreement only applies and only vests a right as far as city approvals go. So if other agencies have authority, which they would over these sorts of things, uh, those agencies aren't bound by the development agreement. And so they would step in and they would say, well, you know, we've done the, the testing that we, that we were required to do or that we uh, said that we were going to do uh, in the future to ensure that this was clean enough before you get to build. It's not clean enough, and so you don't get to build. So it would be the responsibility of those responsible agencies uh, to cover those contingencies. Okay, and that's not really C again. That's not really CEQA, but that's how it would that's how it would come down. That's sort of the relationship between the various agencies. The development agreement that the city enters into can't bind those other agencies because it's a contract between the city and the developer, and those other agencies have no part of it. And so those other agencies are generally agencies that have their own separate authority outside the city. They're not controlled by the city in any way. And so they're certainly free to apply their authority, and they will, their authority to regulate that property um, you know, as, as they need to. And yet if our standards were higher than theirs, their standards would still apply in that case. Their standards would still apply. Yeah, and as I mentioned, it, one of the, maybe it was the BBKG, um, if the city adopts stricter standards, it, it creates um, a problem for the city in a way because the, those other agencies won't enforce the city's standards. It would be up to the city to attempt to enforce their standards. And it may be difficult because they may not have the technical expertise to do that. So in most cases, you don't see cities um, kind of trying to usurp the powers of these other agencies because they know that if they do, there may not be anybody who has the technical expertise to actually implement those mitigation measures because they know that the other agencies won't. So then we would have to rely on the uh, on those other agencies to enforce and protect. Right. Yeah, because that's that's essentially their role. That's their their jobs and their responsibilities. Thank you yeah. for clarification. Mm-hmm. Sure. 
Okay, so uh, we talked about oops, talked about this having to have the same level of detail uh, depending on how much detail you have and the amount of information that's available. Can't defer mitigation measures. Uh, you can uh, defer some of the details if you have these performance standards, if you actually adopt mitigation, and if you have something that describes how they're going to be uh, effective or how they're going to be measured for effectiveness. Uh, what else do we have to say? And then if there's later actions to implement the project, those will be open to CEQA again, but on that limited basis, as we mentioned, under the subsequent EIR approach. Uh, so uh, this just simply lays out the three opportunities for later um, analyses. Substantial changes in the project, substantial changes in the circumstances, new information. Uh, substantial changes would be perhaps the developer decides they're going to move things around on the project site. Instead of this being commercial, we're going to make that uh, residential. Instead of that being residential, we're going to put a commercial area over there. We'd actually like to make the park a little smaller, make the wetlands area a little bigger. Uh, all of those things could potentially be considered under the same EIR, but they, may, they trigger this subsequent analysis. And depending on what the subsequent analysis reveals, it may be that they have to do a subsequent EIR or a subsequent mitigated negative declaration or whatever, depending on whether or not there's new or more uh, new or more severe environmental impacts. Uh, let's see what else. So substantial changes in circumstances could be that um, perhaps a new regulatory agency is created by the state that's now uh, taking a look, looking over the shoulder of the county uh, with regards to landfill and how the landfill is going to be uh, remediated. That would be a change in circumstances. That, again, would require that they take another look at it, so on and so forth. New information could be uh, ten years down the, the road now, we find that the mitigation measures haven't been effective or the perhaps regulatory requirements that these other agencies have imposed haven't been effective and now we realize that there's still uh, ongoing pollution on the site. And so they would, again, reconsider it under this subsequent supplemental approach. And if there's a new impact or a more severe impact, they would do a, a sub subsequent environmental impact report. Okay, so that, that, does that sound clear? These are the three different things that trigger it, and it's a limited review, but at the same time, it's a review that can potentially require another environmental impact report on those particular issues. Uh, this is just another way of looking at it. There's three options, actually, well, four, but we forgot to put one down here. Uh, there's a subsequent EIR or a subsequent negative declaration. An EIR would be done if there's a new or a more severe impact that can't be mitigated. A subsequent mitigated negative declaration would be done if there was a new or more significant impact, but it can be uh, mitigated. And then a supplemental EIR is kind of the same thing. It's just intended to mean that there are fewer changes that have to be made in the original EIR. And then an addendum is used in those situations where there is simply uh, minor changes that are made to the project that don't rise to the level of causing either a new impact or a more severe impact. Uh, there are no mitigation measures that have to be added, uh, and so this addendum can be used. Uh, subsequent EIRs, subsequent negative declarations, supplemental EIRs go through the same CEQA process that an EIR or a mitigated negative declaration would go through. So there's a draft document that goes out for public review, comments are received, the agency prepares a final EIR or final subsequent EIR, um, they make their decision on the project, so on and so forth. Uh, an addendum, on the other hand, doesn't require any public review. So that would not go out for a 45-day review period or anything like that because it's only for technical changes. One of the other things that these are used for or potentially could be used for if there need to be changes, major changes to the, to the mitigation measures. Uh, the courts have held that uh, one way of making major changes to mitigation measures is to prepare a subsequent EIR that discusses, well, what's changed? Why do we have to change this mitigation measure in a substantial way? And by doing that and focusing in on just the mitigation measures and why it's being changed or why it's being deleted, uh, that, again, provides a public process for the public to weigh in, the agency to consider, and then make their decision on whether or not to keep the mitigation measure or whether or not to make substantial changes to a mitigation measure. There are a couple of court cases on this over the years, one up in Napa County, where Napa had adopted a specific plan for the airport area uh, they decided later that they were going to change some of the mitigation measures relating to traffic because of changes that were being made to the specific plan and the industrial mix in the specific plan. And so the court held that 
they were perfectly fine in adopting a subsequent EIR to discuss the changes they were making in the, uh, the mitigation measures. Uh, there was also an uh, EIR that was challenged in Southern California by a, a renters group uh, within, uh, what you'd call it, kind of a historic uh, bungalow, set of bungalows, uh, apartments. They were pretty extensive apartment complex. A uh, developer wanted to tear those down, uh, build something else, uh, some other more expensive condos on the site. Uh, one of the mitigation measures was that uh, any time they demolished one of the existing units, they had to offer the existing uh, resident of that unit the opportunity to rent another unit within the same complex. So it's this odd mitigation measure, but that's what it was. It turned out that the um, developer decided they weren't going to do that. And so they began trying to evict people without offering the opportunity to move into another vacant unit within the same complex. Uh, they got sued by the neighborhood group, uh, went to court. The court said, well, you know, you could change the mitigation measure, because this mitigation measure isn't set in stone. But you can't do it without doing a subsequent environmental impact report, because you have to re-examine what the impacts would be of getting rid of that mitigation measure, because they wanted to literally excise that mitigation measure. So a couple of examples of situations where courts have said, here's what mitigation is. Uh, you, you must follow it. But if you want to change it, then you can follow one of these approaches, subsequent EIR, or perhaps even an addendum to an EIR, if there's no new impact and all you're doing is ma making some minor modifications to a mitigation measure. Any questions on that? People have quizzical, thoughtful looks on their faces. Yeah. We pass the microphone. Um, I just wanted to ask who gets to decide when each of these, I mean, I know that the, it's laid out to some degree in CEQA, but on the sort of fringe cases, you know, when you get the developer saying, I think an addendum is adequate, and you get the city saying, I think a supplemental is required, how, how does that decide? I mean, does that automatically? Right, so who decides? The lead agency always decides. So the city is going to always be the one to make that decision. Or if it were something that were in front of the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and they were lead agency, they would be the ones to make the decision. So the applicants, typically the applicants make their best case as to, oh, well, you know, we think it should be this or that. But it's always the responsibility of the lead agency, whether it's the city or some responsible agency, to uh, take the responsibility of saying, yes, we're going to do it this way, or we've decided we're going to do it that way. But it's their choice. Because they run the show. Uh, so we talked about this already. Um, a program EIR applies to things that are, quote, within its scope. So generally, that means that things that are within the, the geographic boundaries of the area that was discussed. Uh, there's an old court case from Sonoma County, where Sonoma County uh, essentially approved a new grading or not grading, or a new gravel mining ordinance. There we go, gravel mining ordinance. Uh, it covered a particular geographic area of the Russian River. A uh, developer came in who wanted to open a new open pit gravel mine on the Russian River, but it was just outside the area that was described in the ordinance. The county said, well, it seems close enough to us. We'll use the program EIR we did for the ordinance. Uh, when it went to court, the court said, no, you can't do that. It's not within the scope of the program EIR if it's actually outside of the area that was originally studied. So within the scope basically means it has to be within the area that was studied, and it has to be related to that original project in some way. It can't be something completely new. OK, so if, uh, for example, the Baylands project were approved, uh, and let's say 10 years down the line, the developer decides that they're not going to do that at all, uh, they turn into a completely different application for a completely different project. Uh, now it's going to be, we're going to be building, uh, it's going to be an industrial plant to build uh, new cars for the high-speed rail train that's going to go in. And we're also going to be building new cars for Caltrain and for uh, Metrolink down in Southern California because we know that they've gotten billions of dollars in state money to improve their systems. So we're going to build a giant industrial plant there to build rail cars. That isn't anything like what the original project was. So chances are that wouldn't be within the scope of the program EIR. Chances are the city would require them to do a totally different EIR because it's a totally different project. It's not just tweaking and making modifications of the original project. It's just completely different. So that wouldn't fall within the program EIR either. OK, so program EIR is intended to streamline these later activities. As you may know, uh, an EIR is triggered relatively easily when it's an original EIR. If a project um, would potentially have an impact on the environment, well, that means an EIR has to be done. Uh, but with a subsequent approach, 
there has to be substantial evidence that, the poten that there's a potential for this impact uh, that the city doesn't have substantial evidence for the other, the other argument. So in other words, if the city has evidence that indicates that there wouldn't be an impact, then the city does not have to prepare a subsequent EIR, even though there may be evidence that others propose. Okay, does that make sense? So who gets to decide? The decision is the city's. Okay, and if it goes to court, this is a complex issue, but if it goes to court, then the courts will give deference to the city's decision if the city has evidence on the record that supports what it's done. Okay, now if it were an original EIR, the original the EIR that's being done today, uh, and the decision is whether to do a negative declaration versus doing an EIR, let's say the city decided it was going to do a negative declaration for this project. Well, there's lots of evidence that indicates that there might be an environmental impact report. And if the city were taken to court over that, uh, the court would not give deference to the city because it's an original EIR. It's the question, original question of whether or not to do an EIR. And so the city, the court would look at both sides of the argument. They would, uh, people who are opposed to the project would obviously say, well, look, Department of Toxic Substances Control says that there are uh, pollu there's pollutants on the site and they're going to need to go about remediating it. We think an EIR is necessary. Uh, and even though the, the city may argue, well, you know, they're going to take care of that. We're not worried about it. Um, that would trigger an EIR. So that's one reason why cities and counties, et cetera, do lots and lots of EIRs because it's a relatively easy threshold that, that can be crossed in order to trigger an EIR. Okay? But once an EIR is done, then in the interest of finality, the courts create a different threshold. And that threshold is based on whether or not the agency has evidence to support its, its decision. Okay, so in the first instance, the court is going to weigh evidence on both sides of the question. If there's evidence indicating there might be an impact, they would require an EIR. In the second case, the court is going to give deference to the city as long as the city has evidence to support it. Okay, so in this case, we're talking about cities doing an EIR. So if the subsequent one is necessary, the, city, the court is going to tend to defer to the determinations of the city regarding that second EIR. Okay, and then uh, any litigation that occurs after the original EIR is uh, certified, and if there are no challenges to the original EIR, then any litigation that occurs regarding the subsequent EIR, the subsequent mitigated negative declaration, focuses in on that process, the subsequent process, not the original EIR. As I mentioned, the EIR, CEQA doesn't really provide for updating EIRs. There's no such thing as going in and updating your EIR every five years or something like that. The EIRs are what they are. And then it relies on this later subsequent analysis to pick up new things that are occurring, analyze them, require mitigation if necessary, and then move on with the project. Okay? And you could deny it too, but otherwise move on with the project. So typical EIRs, we've already sent out the notice of preparation. Uh, there were comments that we received. City is going to consider all the comments that came in for the notice of preparation. Uh, those will be integrated into the draft EIR to the extent that the city feels they're necessary. Uh, the city doesn't necessarily have to respond to any of those comments that were received on the notice of preparation. Simply has to consider them while it's drafting the EIR. Okay. And then the Question? What does it mean they have to consider them? They have to think about them. They have to decide like whether... Like what, 20 seconds? Or? Uh, depends on how important it is, how long it is. If it's a long letter with lots of uh, interesting information, it's going to get a lot more consideration from the city than if it's a short letter that says, uh, I don't like this project. You know, so the more technical, more technical things are going to get more technical consideration by the city. But consideration just means that the city has to think about those things and decide whether or not it feels that they're pertinent to the discussions that go in the EIR. Now, anything that comes in on a notice of preparation, that's part of the overall record, you know, all part of the administrative record. So the city has to handle those very carefully because uh, if there's a lawsuit on this project, all of that is part of the lawsuit. That will all be part of the record that the, that the court considers in the lawsuit. So if the city simply ignores notice of preparation um, suggestions and doesn't really in, in think about them, doesn't incorporate them, that increases the chances that that might be a poison pill that will pop up later during the litigation and, you know, not be good for the city. So 
So cities, their EIR consultants are generally really good about thinking about the various things that have come in during the notice of preparation phase, uh, including those that they think are pertinent, uh, including those that they think um, warrant some additional discussion. Uh, and then some of them, you know, for one reason or another, just don't get included. But CEQA doesn't require that they actually write down how they handled each one of those comments that came in, unlike what happens with the draft EIR. Okay, so once the, the draft EIR is done, it will have all these different components and it will have the project description, the objectives of the project, the uh, uh, environmental setting for each of the resources, the potential impacts, the mitigation measures. It will look at the alternatives. Uh, it will disclose the significance of the impacts. It will do all of that stuff. Uh, it goes out for a, a minimum 45-day review period. The city is actually providing for 120 days, so it's going well beyond the minimum. Uh, and then people get to comment on that. Those comments have to be responded to in writing by the city in what's called the final EIR. So the draft EIR goes out, uh, reviewed by the public, by other agencies. Comments are received by the city. And then the city has to sit down and respond to those comments in writing. And in some cases, maybe they get the same comment 10 times. Uh, they don't have to respond the, the same way 10 times. They can just do it once and call it, sometimes they'll call it a master response or a standard response. Uh, and then each of the additional times it pops up, they'll just say, see res master response number one. Okay. But they do have to respond to each one of those that comes in. Uh, so this is what an EIR, finally, our contains. It would be the comments that were received, the written responses to the various comments, a list of the commenters, the people, the agencies that commented, uh, and the draft EIR, and anything, that, anything that's been changed in the draft EIR. Because sometimes the comments will warrant making changes to the EIR itself, uh, maybe fixing up a mitigation measure, make, making it a little better than it was earlier, uh, perhaps adding some new information that hadn't been available before, uh, maybe clarifying some point that the comments indicate are not, is not very clear. So any of those revisions go into the final EIR too. And a lot of times it's actually a two-part document. There'll be a final EIR that has these comments, responses, and changes, and then there'll be the draft EIR in its original form. Okay. Uh, before the project can be approved, the city has to quote unquote certify the EIR. And those are the three things that were required of certification. They have to go on, on the record in writing saying that uh, this meets the requirements of CEQA. Uh, we've taken a look at it. We're familiar with the document. And it reflects the city of Brisbane's independent judgment. And why independent judgment is in there is a recognition on the part of CEQA that uh, there will be consultants preparing these things, either working directly for the city or in some cases, I say oftentimes in Southern California, consultants that the applicant is hired and is working for the applicant. So in either case, the agency has to make sure that those things reflect the agency's judgment and go on record as saying that they reflect that judgment. OK, so typical contents. We find the table of contents, an executive summary, which is a quick run through of all the stuff that's in the EIR. Executive summaries usually have the project description in short form. Uh, a uh, set of the objectives often has tables that will uh, indicate these are the alternatives, these are the, the brief rundown of the impacts from the alternatives so we can compare them. Uh, we'll often have a table listing the mitigation measures and the impacts that are being uh, covered by the mitigation measures. Uh, then we have a project description, which goes into more detail about what the project is, has maps and diagrams and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, it will also have sp specific project objectives, the things that uh, the project is intending to do. The project objectives are the city's objectives. So the applicant may have objectives of their own, uh, but the objectives that show up in the EIR are those that reflect the city's, the city's wants and needs. Uh, then there'll be impact chapters, uh, you know, going all the way from air quality to public utilities, and each one having an environmental setting, describing what's out there right now, uh, what the impacts might be from this project, whether or not the impacts are significant, uh, if it's significant, mitigation measures, specific measures that would be applied to reduce the significance. Uh, and then a final determination as to whether or not it's significant with the mitigation or not. And then the alternatives to the project. Uh, in this case, the city is looking at, a, I guess, several alternatives. They always have to look at no project alternatives. Uh, then they'll look at the project itself. And then they're, they're going to be looking at one project alternative at the same level as the project, that community-based alternative and then other alternatives at a lesser level of detail than the project. CEQA provides that 
uh, you do not have to look at the alternatives at the same level of detail as the project. So it's up to the city to decide whether or not it wants to look at any of the alternatives at the same level of detail. And if it does, which alternatives it wants to look at the same level of detail. Because these alternatives are written into the EIR, the city has the opportunity to actually adopt an alternative rather than the project itself. We're using that same EIR. So if they decide, well, we don't like Baylands, but we do like the community-based alternative, uh, they could go about approving that one. Or we like the energy, uh, what was it, the sustainable energy or whatever it's renewable called? Energy. Renewable energy alternative, where we turn it into a solar farm or whatever. Um, if they like that one better, they could potentially approve that one based on this EIR. Question. Question. So if, if the developer disagrees with the city at that time, can the developer take the city to court based on the fact that they don't agree with what the city is approving? Right. So if the, uh, the developer doesn't like what the city does, uh, they could take the city to court. Sure, people take the cities to court all the time. Uh, but would they win? Probably not. Because it, it, the decision is really the city's based on um, the environmental impact report as well as the authority that the city has to either approve or deny projects and select what project they want to approve. So they don't really have much in the way of standing, to, not standing, but much in the way to stand on as far as attempting to win a lawsuit like that. Well, there's an interesting case happening right now in Mendocino County with, a, with the wineries drawing down the uh, headwaters of the Russian River for frost control. Mm -hmm. And the property owners are saying that the county's ordinances about taking water from the Russian River are impinging on their property rights. Mm. And so they're attacking. So could the developer do the same thing against the city, saying that the city's, it sounds like the it's, city's taking yeah. away their property rights by maybe choosing an environmental approach right. to the project? Yeah, they don't really have any property rights along those lines. What it sounds as though what the folks in Mendocino are alleging is that they have some sort of vested right to undertake a particular activity. Developers don't have an, a vested right. Uh, and even zoning approvals, general plans, don't necessarily give you a vested right to do anything with your land. Uh, under California law, um, as the late great John Dan Curtin used to say, uh, development is a privilege, not a right. Uh, and so it means that uh, these vested rights aren't necessarily vested unless they not only get an approval from the city, but they invest a substantial amount of money uh, working towards uh, actually undertaking that approval. So simply having a zone change or that sort of thing, or whatever the existing zoning out there might be, it doesn't necessarily give them a, a winning hand in a vested rights suit. Okay, I'm not an attorney, but you know, that, that's the way it generally comes down. They would have to really show that they've been putting a lot of money into this, and not just a little money, but a lot of money into this, uh, and thereby creating some sort of a vested right. And if the city hasn't approved the project, well, all bets are off. No matter how much money they've put into it, that's not a vested right. That's a proposal that they had. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything or no. Okay, so um, kind of getting off off the track there, but uh, so also they'll have to talk about cumulative impacts, growth-inducing impacts. Cumulative impacts are going to be those impacts of the project that are contributing to other impacts that are already out there. Air quality, for example is a cumulative impact. It's all of us driving our cars around, even me and the Prius, uh, and emitting emissions into the air and making the air a little bit worse for everybody. That's a cumulative impact. Lots and lots of little activities coming together to make a significant impact. And so the EIR will have to look at the project's contribution to that. So for air quality, for traffic, uh, perhaps water quality, uh, it's going to be looking at those and determining whether or not the project is making a substantial or considerable contribution in other words, a significant contribution to this cumulative impact. And if it is, the EIR will own up to that, and it will also offer mitigation measures, if there are any feasible mitigation measures, to try and avoid this, the uh, project's contribution. Uh, then we have a list of preparers and references. It's important, oops, hey, come back here. It's important for the uh, EIR to talk about who the references are, uh, so that it cite, cites the various sorts of um, studies and other sorts of um, information that's available out there that support its particular contentions, its particular determinations and conclusions. So all of those go into the references. Um, and as I say, it's important to, to keep track of those as the EIR preparer uh, to make sure that uh, 
it's really clear where you can find those various things. Because those also will be part of the administrative record. And those help support what the city's conclusions are by making those references. And then any technical appendices, those tend to be things like a traffic study, um, if there are completed uh, you know, uh, characterization, risk characterization studies, you know, those sorts of things, uh, air quality analysis, all of those would be technical appendices that would be attached to the EIR as well. So what else? Okay, so EIR considerations. Some of the things to consider, environmental setting, uh, we've talked about this in the other presentations. It's so basically what's out there right now. Uh, the baseline is the environmental setting. The baseline is where you begin your environmental process. You look at the baseline versus what would happen with the project, and the space in between those is the impact. So baseline, project, and then in between is the impact. And then we make our determination on that area in between the two as to whether or not that impact is significant. Uh, what makes baseline important is that baseline um, is obviously going to be the, the way you begin your environmental analysis, and it can vary between resources. The baseline for one resource may be different than the baseline for the other resource. Uh, for example, baseline for um, biology would potentially be what's out there today. Uh, baseline for um, uh, water quality, for uh, level of uh, soil contamination is basically going to be what's out there today. Uh, on the other hand, traffic baseline, a uh, traffic baseline may be sometime in the future. It may be, for example, uh, traffic as it may exist at the time the project uh, enters operation. Because that would give you a better idea of what the traffic impacts are going to be, rather than looking at what's out there right now, uh, and the project isn't going to be built for, say, 10 years, uh, versus what would potentially be there in 10 years uh, with the project and without the project. Okay. It provides this context for the environmental analysis, as the, ba the baseline does. So here it talks about normally is what the CEQA, base CEQA guidelines say. Normally baseline uh, is existing conditions, but that varies. One thing that the baseline cannot be is hypothetical future conditions. Uh, there's a court case down in Southern California where uh, one of the air districts was going to issue a permit for a refinery enhancement. The refinery was going to be producing, instead of... Uh, this heavy sort of diesel, it was going to be producing a, a low carbon diesel fuel, uh, and a, a better diesel. Uh, but in doing so, it would increase the amounts of emissions, air quality emissions, that, that, that the uh, place generated. Um, the air district looked at what the permit allowed. And the, let's say if I were holding up my hand, the permit allowed this much emissions. Um, the project was going to be producing this much emissions. And the existing level of emissions was here at the top of the table. Uh, the district said, well, look, the permitted amount is this much, and the emissions are down here. We think it's less than significant, and so we're going to do a negative declaration. The California Supreme Court looked at it and said, well, you have to look at what's actually possible. Uh, and you can't use a hypothetical future condition, this permitted condition, as your baseline if it's impossible to actually do that. And as it turned out, the uh, air district indeed had permits for that refinery, but the permits applied to three different boilers that were on the refinery, and they couldn't possibly run all three boilers at once. So it was actually impossible for the refinery to ever produce as many emissions as it was permitted to. So the court said you, you can't use that as a baseline. On the other hand, uh, it did say that we're going to give some flexibility to agencies. And it, there are some cases in the past, the court said, where uh, permitted conditions have actually been reached by project. There was a... There was a um, a gravel mine in Ventura County, for example, it had a particular limit placed on the traffic that could go in and out of the mine. And sometimes the mine traffic actually reached that level. And the court said, you could use that for the baseline, because sometimes you actually reach that level. There were also cases where um, there were fluctuations in the amount of activity. And the court said, well, you know, you could average those out if you wanted. A situation might be if you're, um, you're building next to a stream or a river that has cyclical flows. You could average those out and use that as the baseline. So the baseline always, isn't always going to be exactly existing conditions right now at one point in time, but we're going to give you some flexibility. But the thing it can't be is this future hypothetical condition. OK, so a question? Would you say that the existing condition in the Baylands is that there is very little contact between humans and the, and, and, um, uh, the toxins out there? Would that be an existing condition? 
Not necessarily. Yeah, nobody there. Not necessarily. No, the level of toxins would be the existing conditions. The impact would be that people would now be there, and so that would change the risk. You know, the risk of potential exposure, and so that would be the impact, but not the fact that there's nobody out there. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of mixed in because the risk would be measured, the baseline risk would be measured with nobody out there, but a certain amount of toxic toxicity. And then with the project, it's going to be, yeah, people are out there, and it's going to change the risk factor. But simply the fact that there's nobody out there isn't necessarily baseline per se. Yes, you have a question. Is it? I mean, to me, it seems like baseline should be what clean land would look like. But it doesn't sound like that. No, it's not that. It's not that. No. Okay. No, and there have been a couple of court cases. There was one down in Southern California having to do with someone who was getting a permit, I think, again, for a gravel mine, gravel mine or something like that. There had been illegal activities occurring on the property. And they had already been doing a bunch of mining. They'd torn up a bunch of habitat. All this kind of stuff had been done apparently by a previous owner. And the baseline that the county wanted to use in that case was existing conditions, not what it had originally been before they began their illegal activities. And the court said, that's fine. It says normally existing conditions, that doesn't mean having to go back in time. There's another case in Sacramento County with an airport, the same thing. I hear you saying it can be done that way, but can it be done the other way? Or is that out of the question? Typically not, right. Typically not done the other way. And one of the things is that there has to be some sort of a, you know, you have to, it says normally existing conditions. So that means that you wouldn't necessarily go back in time. Unless there's some reason to, as I say, it may be a cyclical sort of a thing. And so you would, you would average out over time. Or perhaps at some previous point in time, there was some level that was, permit level that was, that was maxed out. And so in that Ventura County case with the gravel mine, that had been a kind of a past activity, but it, again, was cyclical. So it could be expected it was going to occur again. But it's quite unusual for agencies to go back in time and apply a, a, a pre-existing condition as a baseline. Yes. I, oh, go ahead. Finish up. I have one more question about uh -huh. baseline. Um, you were talking about using maybe the average flow of a river as baseline, but it seems to me like when you're planning, you want to use the maximum flow of the river when considering your project, sort of like, you know, are you or are you not in a floodplain? Well, you are if it flooded within the last sure, 100 years. Sure, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, are so there you times would. that right. you can use the maximum sure. potential impact? Sure, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so for a floodplain is a perfect example. Okay. Yeah. The cyclical river thing would, would potentially come into play if you were considering, um, you know, aquatic species and those sorts of things and variations in the numbers of fish, for example, that might be in the river. So that you wouldn't go in and take a look at the river at low flow and say, well, there's hardly any fish in it, so we're not going to have any impact. You know, there may be lots of fish at other times, and so you'd perhaps, you know, level those things out. Same thing, it, you know, it's a practical thing. Uh, botanic surveys. You wouldn't necessarily say that in the winter we're going to uh, call that the existing conditions. And since we went out and did a botanic survey, there aren't any rare plants out there. That's also one that would potentially be kind of a cyclical thing. And in order to say that there aren't going to be any, you'd have to go out and do botanic surveys at the proper time. And that would be the existing condition. OK, so when it says normally existing conditions, it doesn't necessarily mean a particular strict point in time. There's, there's flexibility in there. But it doesn't mean sometime far in the future where there's absolutely no potential of that thing ever happening. OK, like the permitted capacity of the, or com permitted emissions levels of this refinery, that the refinery literally couldn't ever reach. Yes? So I have two questions. One, the baseline cannot be hypothetical future conditions. Would sea level rise be considered a hypothetical future condition? Yeah, good question. You know, sea level rise is a really interesting issue because uh, no, I don't think it would be a hypothetical future condition because we have pretty good, in, pretty good uh, information about uh, potential future sea level rise, particularly in, uh, along the coast in San Francisco Bay, that sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, there's a recent court case down in Southern California. Uh, again, it, it's precedent, but doesn't necessarily mean that all courts are going to follow it. Uh, but there's a court case down in Southern California where the court down there specifically held that sea level rise was not an impact under CEQA. Uh, because it was a change in the, it was an in impact of the environment on the project, 
rather than the project on the environment. So they took a very strict reading of what CEQA's language has to say. But that's one court case. We don't know if that's going to carry over to other ones. Uh, it's only precedent within that uh, particular appellate district down in Southern California. But it's certainly something that's going to be argued uh, in the future throughout the state now that that decision has been rendered. So it's a little bit up in the air. But I would say that, yeah, sea level rise is one where we have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. And you could, the, uh, what's it called, uh, ABAG, for example, the Association of Bay Area Governments has done a very nice map that has some of the, the most recent information about sea level rise. And so you would certainly want to take that into consideration. And that wouldn't necessarily be, um, you know, a future hypothetical. Uh, at the same time, that you may not necessarily use that as your baseline because it may be something that's in the future. Uh, so the city, again, has some flexibility as to how they want to handle it. Uh, they may want to look at it as the cumulative future so that they would still consider it in the EIR, but it would just technically be in a different spot in the EIR. So it wouldn't necessarily be baseline, but it might be the cumulative uh, thing that the project is, con is contributing to. So either way, they would have to disclose whether or not uh, sea level rise might adversely affect the project. Okay, so then the other question I had is about the existing conditions. And in particular, currently in the Baylands, we've uh, permitted the property owner to have a, a, like a soil and gravel recycling, you know, operation. And they've raised the level considerably of the, the height of the mass mm -hmm. over part of the, the um, old dump. Now, that now becomes the existing condition. Right, that would that would be the existing condition, right? So the further that it's allowed to deteriorate, or the different things that are allowed to happen out there now contribute to what the current existing condition would be at the time that the EIR is right. Now. Right. Well, the way the existing condition is, it generally is at the time the notice of preparation is sent out, uh, or at the time that the environmental analysis begins. So it would be up to the city to determine exactly where, what it wants to consider as the existing condition. So it, it isn't going to be as though they could go out there and start dumping more stuff and raise the level all of a sudden. Uh, the city may not accept that as the existing condition. So what's in the EIR now uh, is probably going to be the existing condition for what's in the EIR finally. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, so significance, uh, change in the project from existing conditions. That's what the, wh how we determine significance. Uh, CEQA itself doesn't really define the term. It just says substantial adverse change in the physical conditions of the, uh, of the area. So substantial, significant, they're almost the same. I mean, they're practically synonyms. So it um, doesn't really give us a lot of, of determination. But what cities generally do, and what, what I'm sure that Brisbane will do, is to take a look at regulatory standards, uh, take a look at what its own uh, Regulations may be, for for example, for level of service for traffic, uh, that sort of thing, noise standards. Uh, agencies generally apply these regulatory standards as a means of determining what might be significant or not. Uh, they'll rely probably on uh, what other agencies have to say, the agencies with technical expertise in the area. Uh, Air Quality District, for example, has adopted CEQA guidelines that lay out what it considers to be the thresholds of significance for air quality emissions. So the city is going to use those. Uh, in any case, those uh, thresholds that the city uses will be disclosed in the EIR itself. So in its impact analysis, it will disclose these are the thresholds that we're using to determine whether or not this is significant. And then we talked about the alternatives. Uh, no project alternatives is a given. All the EIRs have to discuss the no project alternative, which is basically what happens if we don't do the project. Uh, the other alternatives have to be potentially feasible. Uh, they have to meet most or all of the project objectives, and then they also have to reduce one or more of its impacts in order to be considered a, a, an alternative. Uh, it looks as though this EIR is looking at three different alternatives plus the project, and as I said, they can be examined at a lower level of detail based on what the you know how the city wants to handle it. Uh, what else? Uh, EIR doesn't have to look at every possible alternative. There's what's called the rule of reason, and so. Um, they can look at a reasonable range, but not necessarily every potential or possible alternative. Uh, they're also going to look at those that are potentially feasible. The city doesn't have to go about determining the final feasibility of any alternative that's in the EIR. Uh, they can determine that at the end when they make their decision on the project. 
Uh, if it turns out that the no project alternative is environmentally superior or the best of the alternatives, then amongst the other alternatives, the remaining alternatives, the city has to identify which of those is environmentally superior. Uh, that's kind of a vestige, that particular requirement of uh, the National Environmental Policy Act. The city isn't required to adopt the environmentally superior alternative. It simply has to identify it amongst the other alternatives. And then, as I said before, uh, once the EIR is certified, the city could choose to approve one of the alternatives in place of the project if it wanted to do that. And then cumulative impacts, we talked about that before. Um, the analysis is going to be whether or not this project is making a considerable or a significant contribution to these cumulative impacts. If it is, then have to propose mitigation measures and so on and so forth, just like any other impact. And then mitigation measures, uh, efforts to avoid, minimize, rectify, et cetera, the potential impacts of the project, they have to be detailed enough to be effectively implemented. Uh, if the details are deferred, you have to have those performance standards in place of detail. Uh, and you have to have a way of measuring the effectiveness as well. Anything else? A uh, city can't defer its obligation to adopt mitigation measures. So if it knows there's an impact, it's obligated to adopt mitigation measures, even if the mitigation measures are these relatively broad ones that have performance standards. Uh, some, there's a court case, I guess it's kind of a court case, court case down in, southern, in uh, Central California where an agency was, for, was looking at a project that had potential impact on groundwater, groundwater supplies, uh, they decided to simply call it significant and unavoidable, not include any mitigation measures, and the court hit them over the head for that. Can't do that. Even though there may be mitigate, even though there may be impacts that are significant, you're obligated to look at mitigation measures as a city uh, unless you find them infeasible. And if they're infeasible, you have to explain why they're infeasible. Okay. So what else? Okay. So um, I think we already talked about that performance standards, etc. The uh, city has to adopt a mitigation monitoring reporting program if it approves the project. The MMRP is intended to make sure that the mitigation measures that the city is adopting are implemented. As each of the responsible agencies comes along for its own permit process, it will adopt a mitigation monitoring and reporting program for its mitigation measures. So taken all together, these series of mitigation monitoring reporting programs should cover all of the mitigation measures that were adopted by all the various agencies that approved the project at one time or another. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. I had questions about this last mm -hmm. time when I was listening to your first um, tape. So on the MMRPs, who funds that? How do you fund the MMRPs? Right. And, and regardless of the agencies owning the mitigation. And, and then you said last night, uh, Nothing to say that the, if the mitigation works, even if they don't work, they still have to monitor and report. Right. And, it, and it's like, for how long? Till hell freezes over or, or what? Right. It depends on the particular measure. And the, the, it's the responsibility of the, of the uh, city or the other agency that's adopting the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Uh, they can undertake that cost themselves, depending on the particular requirement of the program, because it, it generally have each impact, each significant impacts mitigation measure listed, and then you have how you're going to go about monitoring that. And so some of the mitigation measures may be very detailed in what's required to monitor. Other ones may be relatively simple. Maybe the building inspector makes sure that they've uh, installed a six-foot fence that was required or something like that. Uh, other cases, it may be, um, well, like we talked about before, um, biological remediation or something like that, restoration. In which case, it might be something that takes place over a series of years and would take uh, monitoring over that period of time as well. And so for the first one, building inspector, maybe the city covers the cost of that one. For the other one, uh, maybe it's something they're going to require the developer to cover the cost for. Uh, they, the city is authorized to uh, charge fees of the developer to cover the costs of the CEQA process. And that includes the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Now, when I said that it it intends to uh, ensure that it's implemented, but doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's effective. What I meant by that is that agencies have to make sure that the mitigation measures themselves are written in such a way that they're going to be effective. So if there's contingency issues that they're worried about, they need to put those contingency uh, considerations into the mitigation measures. Because the mitigation monitoring reporting program itself isn't a condition of approval. It's simply oversight by the city to make sure that the things get implemented. 
So it's important that the mitigation measures themselves contain all the requirements that are going to be necessary to make good mitigation measures. Does that make sense? Because they're different things. The EIR and its mitigation measures are different than the mitigation monitoring program and reporting program. Right. So if so there again, how do you fund the MMRP? So say, for instance, it's a biological thing, like you have to do a butterfly count uh, on X number of transects once a year to ensure that, or, or to, you know, that's part of the monitoring mm -hmm. or mitigation efforts of replacing habitat or whatever. And so then, who pays for that? Right. Yeah, I would and suggest... how long? Uh -huh. Right. And yeah, that wouldn't actually, hopefully, wouldn't actually be the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. That would be something that you would have in your mitigation measure itself. And so the reporting program is going to be something along the lines of, this mitigation measure requires that you do transects, et cetera. Um, every six months, you, sh you shall have, or let's say every month, during the, this particular period during which this program is under, under being undertaken, because it will be seasonal, right? Because the butterflies aren't there all the time. Right. Uh, during this particular season, uh, you shall provide reports to the city on a regular basis, et cetera, et cetera. That would be the monitoring program, okay? Whereas the mitigation measure itself is the one that's going to say, we want you to undertake transects. Uh, we want to have um, biologists who are you know, knowledgeable in the uh, characteristics of the butterfly. Uh, Mission Blue, is it? Yeah. Yeah, the Mission yeah. Blue, let's say, for example. I'm not sure it lives here on the flats, but if it did. That's um, uh, familiar with the characteristics of this butterfly, so on and so forth. All of that's going to be written into the mitigation measure itself, and the purpose. And it's going to say it's, we're going to do this, you know, in, for this season and the next season, and so on and so forth. And if we find the butterflies, this is what we're going to do. Uh, if we don't find the butterflies on one survey, I'm making this up because I'm not a biologist, right? But if we don't find the butterflies on one survey, on this survey, then we'll return in two weeks to survey again during the, their potential. Um, during the season while they're potentially okay. butterflying around. Uh, so that's what you'd have in the mitigation measure itself, right. okay? So that's what I mean. That detail has to go into the mitigation. The mitigation monitoring program is going to be relatively simple, uh, and it's going to be you shall provide reports, for example. You shall re provide regular reports on uh, the findings of the butterfly surveys during this particular period of time uh, provided by your biologist to the city Something along those lines. But there's a cost associated. Sure, and that would be parts. right, and that would be covered by the applicant or by the developer. Until when? Until the city decides that it's been completed. So. Would and that would be hopefully be written into the mitigation measure itself. Yeah, I so would like for instance tox toxic uh, toxic the toxic conditions there. So so say who has to monitor that? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, as stuff you know seeps out into the groundwater or rises up through the dump. Right. Or that's going to depend on right. It will depend on what the mitigation measure is, and it's probably not going to be the city's responsibility. It's going to be uh, those other agencies, DTSC or the regional board, and it's going to be part of their mitigation monitoring program, right? Because the city doesn't really have the authority to to implement any of that stuff. It's really the authority of those other agencies. But all and those, so those cost money. Right. And all of those agencies can charge the developer that money. But the developer 30 years from now is long gone. Well, if the agency decides that it's up to them as they adopt their mitigation to ensure that that mitigation is going to occur over time, they're not necessarily limited simply to fees. Uh, they could require that the developer put up a, a, a bond, for example. That's something that's commonly done. So that if the developer skips after a period of time, they forfeit the bond. The bond is used to continue the mitigation monitoring. So there's a variety of different techniques that cities undertake. So it wouldn't necessarily simply be that they give a bill to the developer every month and get the money back. Um, there's a variety of different ways that they can do it. Yeah. Uh, you have to ask him if you can ask the question. This is a couple of people, John. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Give him the microphone. Hi. Uh, I think it's on. Well, hello. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is John Christopher Burr. I'm proud to be a lifelong resident of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really tricky area, I think, because uh, a lot of cities, well, a lot of a lot of agencies seem to say they they have consultants that say, oh, it's mitigated or it'll be mitigated later, and then of course it doesn't ever get mitigated. Uh, nothing is ever done. 
and um, the thing that uh, they were trying to avoid actually occurs. Um, and I can, uh, I'm familiar with the San Bruno Mountain uh, Habitat Destruction Plan up here. Um, and there, uh, when they originally did it way back in the 80s, they thought that I think it was 25, as little as $25,000 a year would be enough to uh, protect the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, right off the top, that seems woefully inadequate. And I think it's proven to be that way over the years. So they've tried to tried to increase the funding over the years. Um, there, when they built these projects, they, they slapped the fee on the, the, the ultimate housing uh, owners so that they have to pay a fee every year. So there's a continuous stream of money. Um, but with something like a toxic waste dump, which is what we have out here in Brisbane, and we have um, an expert, uh, Dr. G. Fred Lee, saying that it'll, it'll be toxic forever. It'll never be safe. It'll never be not toxic. Um, and, and that uh, he also points out that our regulatory system in America, in California and in the U.S., is woefully inadequate, um, very weak compared to uh, Europe, for example. Um, I wouldn't say that, but yeah. Oh yeah. Well, well, you yeah. uh, are you familiar with the Reach Law, for example? Oh, what is that? That's the uh, the, the law that it took 11 years for the European Union to pass, and it's now considered the strongest, toughest law in the world mm -hmm. regarding toxic. And um, the yeah. burden of proof has shifted. For example, a corporation can't bring out a product, it sell it to people, and then say, "You government have to prove that it's dangerous." Oh, okay. So the precautionary. That's, that's just one thing right. that changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, plus, a lot of a lot of chemicals. Our our laws, as pointed out by I think it was Dr. Lee, um, the list that we have is of, of dangerous chemicals was arrived at from litigation, not from science and doctors and having it vetted or anything like that. So it's woefully inadequate right from the get go. Uh, and then there are exclusions and exemptions and, and things that were grandfathered in. Um, for example, it's my understanding that when they went out here and looked at our toxic waste dump, they didn't even look for mercury, for example. Um, and uh, Dr. Lee points out that uh, in our drinking water, for example, we have, uh, they allow very high levels of arsenic, like 500 times greater than it really should be. Um, so. Relying on other agencies, uh, I think, uh, when, when they have a track record of, of not really doing the job, um, it's probably a mistake for Brisbane to do that. Uh, yeah, uh, we know that they won't, they won't uh, order cleanups, they won't make them uh, haul the toxics away, for example, and remove them. They'll allow them to cover them up and leave them there forever. And, we have an aquifer that comes down from San Bruno Mountain. There's an earthquake fault that runs through that toxic waste dump up in the north end. Um, it's all fill anyway. So uh, it just doesn't make any sense to, uh, to allow uh, things like houses and stuff like that out there. Um, but anyway, what I want to get is, it seems to me that the right thing to do for Brisbane would be to uh, require the developer or the real estate speculators to to deposit a large amount of cash into an account that would be an escrow account and it would, uh, uh, like an endowment, it would generate fees so that the ongoing mitigation could continue for years and years and years and years and years. Um, that way... Well, there's going to be two different things. Well, if you did one, for example, you have to litigate that. Right. What is the cost of mitigation which would be borne by the developer? And the right. other one is the cost of mitigation monitoring. Right. And that'll be up to the city. And that might be something that you'd want to include in a comment. On Absolutely. The yeah. I think, I think you, uh, it's up to them to decide how they're going to go about doing it. That might be one way of doing it. Who's ever making a profit here ought to be paying for, for the consequences. And, and that would seem to be one of them. Right. The, the taxpayers shouldn't be burdened with that kind of thing. Right. Um, so it would seem to me that uh, having an argument. But, but the other thing I see is when it's clear that the real estate speculator is violating the, the terms of the mitigation, nothing is ever done. There's no teeth to, to, to enforcing them to, to uh, go fix whatever it is that they were supposed to fix. 
Uh, they don't yank the permits. They don't slap them with a fine. They well, don't do anything. Yeah, you know, if you look at what happens in, in the Central Valley, for example, I mean, there have been plenty of fines. The Hillmore Cheese Factory, for example, uh, is, is one, uh, one group that was polluted, polluting groundwater, and they were hit with a pretty good-sized fine. So it does happen, and it's something that's kind of outside the authority of, this, of the city to well, do. No, no, we, we have to the city can, uses. well, the city has, the city can approve or deny the project, but from a realistic point of view, the city would have a great deal of difficulty enforcing those requirements, no, because it's going to cost, number one, it would cost the city a great deal of money, and number two, the city doesn't have the expertise to do that, and they won't be able to rely on the regional board, et cetera, to require or implement things that those board, that the board or DTSC didn't apply themselves. Well, those guys let, 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 let uh, Well, that's, uh, that's uh, arguable. We'll have to see what happens. There was a giant tire, tire mm -hmm. pile that was buried out there, and they didn't even know about it until recently, until Michelle brought up there. Right. It was, they were in denial about it for years and years, even though the public told them that it's out there. Right. And, and that's one of the things that the, the city decision the makers were waived. Right. Uh, right. Right. But if I might, if I mm -hmm. might say, if this, if the city does impose, and the city will impose restrictions mm -hmm. um, and conditions of approval, um, uh, then what? If if the if the mitigation monitoring is shown to 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 that that the that the uh, that the mitigation that was required or the conditions that were required are not happening, then what is the enforcement mechanism? It depends on what the city has as enforcement mechanism. I mean, they, there can be pulling of permits if they haven't completed work. Um, the city can certainly uh, take them to court to implement, the to enforce the mitigation measures. It's a whole variety of different things. It depends on the situation. depends on, uh, you know, how the city wants to approach it. But the city has tools. The city has... Uh, you know, land use authority, land use and zoning authority. So they have tools to, to implement that. Yeah, I don't know exactly what they would do because I can't speak for the city. But it, it does have tools. Actually, they would use those tools for the city. Mm -hmm. um, like on a race, for example. Well, yeah. Well, that's just something that, you know, the city's going to have to take into consideration when it approves. And citizens like yourself, I mean, residents will be the ones who are the watchdog on that, that sort of thing. Too, as well, as well as the other agencies. They were supposed to prevent the silting up of our lagoon out there, and they didn't do that. Right, but that's that's a separate project. It's kind of uh, water under the bridge or silt under the bridge, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the on the say the mon the MMRPs and the monitoring and the mitigation efforts, could the money that the developer spends towards the mitigation efforts? and then they're not successful or towards the monitoring and reporting and they're not successful before they begin development, could that money be considered part of their, like could it create a situation where then they would consider themselves to be vested or, you know, have contributed enough to be considered vested? Well, I don't have an answer because it's one of those deals where if in these vested, in, uh, vested rights cases, it's really the court sees it when they know it, knows okay. it when they see it. So. Um, you can't predict in advance how much money it's going to be. Okay. Yeah, the, the case that uh, kind of kicked the whole thing off years and years ago, back in the 70s or 80s, uh, the Avco development case, they literally put millions of dollars uh, into pre-development, and the court nonetheless said they didn't have a vested right. So um, it varies a lot from case to case. You just don't know. Okay. can't predict what the courts will say. And then the other question goes back to the um, hypothetical future or baseline effects or whatever. Mm -hmm. Would uh, the threat of earthquake or the prediction of earthquakes be considered a hypothetical future threat, or is it considered, or in your in your experience, is that considered a baseline um, condition? Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily considered a baseline condition, but it's some, certainly something that's considered during the analysis, right? The potential risk uh, to future residents as a result of earthquake. So. You know, you would take into account the, the soils that underlie the site. You'd take into account the standards that are you know, required of all development here in California. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff would be taken into account. And, and sure. fault line things. Right. Like mm -hmm. okay. Location of faults, distance from faults, uh, probable future ground shaking levels, all of that. So that's not really considered a hypothetical? No, no, that wouldn't be considered hypothetical at all. Certainly not in California. 
Okay. It's not something you can predict necessarily, but it's something that would have to be analyzed and will be analyzed, I'm sure, in the geologic uh, section. Okay. I mean, I haven't seen an EIR that hasn't yet. Yeah, they always do. Uh, oh. oh, do you have a question? Okay, shoot. I'm holding here some maps that I got off of Google about sea level rise. Ah, mm -hmm. And I know that that's now required to be analyzed in your sequel. Um, maybe not. No? Maybe not. We don't know. There's a court case down in Southern California where they specifically said it wasn't. So we have some split in the courts now. Over whether that's or just not an appellate court case, right? That's right. not the Supreme Court. It's not the Supreme Court. Okay. But it sets precedent, and we'll see that same argument pop up. So as I say, I'm not saying that it doesn't have to be. And the clients that I work with, we've been, rep we've been recommending to all of our clients, yes, indeed. Do take a look at sea level rise. Right. But I just want to make it clear that there is some question as to whether or not that's going to be a requirement in the and, future. And what I what I what I've seen from uh, talking to uh, uh, like the guys uh, that work for the state of California when they were doing it, they were they were trying to minimize it instead of talk about the the the, the potential range, which is all the way up to 250 feet of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just every, everything melts. And by then we'll probably be in deep trouble because of our, uh, the water system, which is also another thing that's a problem right. here. Well, there'll be less problems because Sacramento will be inundated and we won't have to worry about the legislature, right? So <laughs> that could be a benefit, actually, to the state if, if we do that. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, um, the last of Dr. Shane Chanson, who, who, uh, who's uh, probably one of the world's most foremost authorities on uh, on uh, climate, uh, corporate caused climate change, mm -hmm. um, says that he's looking for between 30 and 80 feet of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, these Google Maps that I have, this is one a, a one year sea level rise. Right. And uh, mine goes all the way up to 14 meters, I think. But as you can see, here, here, we just pass. Uh, as you can see. Uh -huh. You can see a whole lot of the uh, Bayland's toxic waste dump is underwater, which is just a little bit of sea level rise. Right. Yeah. So this right would be a mitigation measure, and I know that the citizen Brisbane don't want to pay for dikes, ah. and mm -hmm. they don't want to pay for, uh, you know, making making somebody who's supposedly already rich even right. richer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I don't think the state of California is going to pay for a bunch of dikes here. And I don't no, think the federal wouldn't. government isn't either. No, they wouldn't either. So the only way for this to really go forward uh, and, and, and mitigate the potential sea level rise is for there to be dikes and for somebody to pay for it. Well, it depends on what the city decides is a reasonable, reasonably foreseeable future. And although there are some predictions that indicate that it could be a lot, I mean, the, the current predictions are something like three meters, something like that, um, over the next 50 years. Well, there's so, just one meter in Southern Right, yeah. And so. It's very possible that the analysis would run along those lines, you know, the, these reasonably foreseeable futures, rather than the absolute um, potential if everything melts future. It would be unlikely, uh, I, I would think it would be unlikely to see that sort of thing in the EIR. But the EIR will, will probably, I don't know, John, do you know offhand, it's going to be looking at sea level rise? Yeah, so it, it's pretty common practice here in, in Northern California to look at that sort of thing. And if there were, uh, indications that uh, dikes were needed, that would be the responsibility of the developer to put in. It wouldn't be something, because it would, it would benefit that particular project and that particular site, it's not going to be something that the city in general is going to be uh, on, the, on the hook for. What if the consultants uh, either try to minimize it or are simply wrong over time? Is there liability for the consultants who, who you know, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a judge, so I don't know what the liability might be. Yeah, I don't know what the liability might be. Don't have an answer. Because that's outside of outside of my expertise in CEQA. Uh, what about consultants who pontificated on subjects they have no expertise in? Uh, again, it depends. You know, I, it, whether there's any liability, I can't say. I don't know. I don't know if there's liability. I do know there have been court cases, there have been at least a couple of court cases where um, the applicants themselves, the developers themselves, have taken uh, the consultants who are working for the city to court, in one case a county, taking them to court. 
uh, arguing that they had been biased against the project. This was just kind of the opposite, biased against the project. The courts held that there was no liability on the part of the consultants because the lead agency really runs the show. The lead agency is responsible for making all those key decisions. Uh, but as I say, I, I'm not a judge, I'm not an attorney, I don't, don't know what might happen on that. But here are some uh, basic things as far as what the issues might be. You know, CEQA has no standard open space requirements. Uh, those are going to be whatever the city has. Um, the mitigation measures have to be linked to impacts that the project has under the, Calif under the uh, constitutional law determinations. There have been a couple of court cases over it. One was down in Southern California, for example, uh, in Ventura, the one that dealt with the um, folks who wanted to, the Dol Nolans, I should say, who wanted to put in a new house along the Pacific Coast Highway. It was going to be bigger than the old house. And with the old house, you had an instantaneous view of the ocean as you drove by. The new house, there'd be no view. Uh, they were required by the Coastal Commission to put in uh, beach access, dedicate a portion of their beach to allow people to go on the beach. When it went to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court held that there was no nexus or no connection between the impact, which was being able to see the ocean from the Pacific Coast Highway, and the mitigation measure, which was walking up and down the beach, being able to walk up and down the beach. So you're required to have some connection between the two. So mitigation would be limited to what the potential impacts might be. And then as we mentioned in some of the previous, uh, previous uh, workshops, I guess, or classes, uh, it also is limited by the uh, uh, you know, potential, what would you call it, uh, potential amount of impact that the, that the particular project has had. So it has to be a reasonably related to the level of impact that's being provided. Uh, court cases, an example of that is out of the city of Visalia. A number of years ago, somebody wanted to convert an existing house into an office building. It was going to be a dentist or doctor's office. Uh, they did a traffic survey, traffic study. Turned out the traffic was actually going to be a little bit less comparing the house to the professional office. Uh, nonetheless, the city wanted them to dedicate a couple of lanes worth of road uh, along the frontage of the property. And the court said that's not reasonable. It's not related to the amount of impact that they're having. Looking at the traffic study the city of Visalia did, they were actually having no impact. So there'd be no reason to mitigate no impact by requiring two new lanes of road. So the impacts have to be reasonably related to the level of, Im I should say the mitigation has to be reasonably related to the level of impact created by the project. So. Um, you know, these are the sorts of things that open space can do, of course. It provides recreational amenities, it protects biological resources, provides setbacks, it could even provide, um, you know, low-impact development style drainage controls and limit contact with hazardous materials. Uh, so they're all, all things to consider, I guess, with regards to open space. What do you mean by TAC, TAC? Oh, uh, where do I have that? Oh, TAC. Uh, there are toxic air contaminant sources. So diesel is the primary toxic air contaminant. Uh, so you can provide setbacks from major roads. If you project what the traffic will be along the road, it may be that uh, future levels of truck traffic w when the project is built would um, increase the toxic air contaminants to unacceptable levels. Uh, so by providing setbacks with open space, you could avoid that sort of impact. A bit would, uh, is a typical uh, setback for that? Uh, it really depends. The, uh, let's see, I can't remember what it is. But depending on the amount of, of traffic, uh, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, you got me there, I don't remember. It's like a thousand feet, a thousand feet, something along those lines. There's, there are standards that have been laid out uh, as guidelines by the Air Resources Board and are available on their website. Uh, but they've, they've put them out as these guidelines. Whether, again, whether or not those things are going to be enforceable in the future, we don't know because we have that court case, as I mentioned before, about the sea level rise. That court case is radically attempting to change how CEQA is applied throughout the state. So unless we have some clarifying legislation uh, or we have courts that decide they're not going to follow that precedent, uh, it could be troublesome in the future. Yeah, we have other tools that are subject to Sure. Permits and exactly. You get it out of right. You yeah. yeah. But how much you can get out of it, yeah, depends. Okay. So uh, sustainability, CEQA predates sustainability, so CEQA has not a word about sustainability anywhere in it. Um, but at the same time, because it was adopted back in 1970, when we were really starting to begin to think about what sustainability was, but in different terms, uh, it does encourage um, consideration of long-term viability versus short-term gain, which in other words is kind of sustainability. 
so you can, an EIR can kind of credit project sustainability features like transit connections, mixed use, solar facility, open space. These are things that you will typically see an EIR taking credit for if the project reflects those sorts of things or that an EIR may require of a project as mitigation in order to reduce potential impacts. Uh, when it does so, it will have to uh, document that that's actually happening. So if you have mixed use, uh, for example, and easy accessibility between residences and uh, commercial uses, for example, and the argument is this is going to reduce internal car trips, the EIR's traffic study should reflect that sort of thing. If it doesn't, then that's, in, that's an inconsistency within the EIR and something worthwhile pointing out uh, in a comment. Uh, sustainability and mitigation, same thing. Sustainability principles, you, you can take a look at the mitigation measures and see whether or not you're seeing these sustainable principles pop up in them. Uh, in things like aesthetics and biological resources, solid waste disposal, energy, et cetera, et cetera. Those might be places that you would look. Yes, you have another comment? You might pass in the microphone. Uh, I have a question on the last slide, actually. Uh -huh. I, saw, I saw open space up there. Yeah. And this vein seems unique in our world in that it defines open space. It has to be publicly held. Mm -hmm. And then you have something they call open area, which can be, I guess that's functionally equivalent to open space everywhere else. Right. Um, but it confuses a lot of people. Um, but it is true, right, that you can zone uh, private property as open space. Is that not a fact? Sure, you okay. can. Yeah. Now, you have to be careful. You don't have to pay for it or anything, right? <laughs> you have to be careful when you do that because uh, the same court cases that I talked about before uh, also restrict agencies from undertaking what are called regulatory takings. Under the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment requires that if an agency takes property for public use, that it can do so if it offers... Um, just compensation for that property. So you have to offer people and pay them essentially the, uh, you know, the, the going rate for that piece of property, the, the assessed value of that property. Uh, so that means agencies have to be careful in how they apply open space. If you had a project or a project site and you rezoned the entire site to open space, that's going to be problematic. You know, it would be a take. Like but if you give them some allowable use, yeah. then that's probably, you know, you have some defense against the a Right, then you flowers on it or make a dollar a year, everything's fine. Well, it depends. But, you know, it depends on what the court has to say. Uh, but it does offer the opportunity to defend yourself if you're a city. But cities have to be careful in applying open space that way. Okay. Okay. Um, oh. Now, if you have something like a public nuisance, and, uh, or a hazardous waste site that's totally polluted, um, you could zone that as open space for sa health and safety reasons, correct? I have no idea. Again, I'm not an attorney. I don't know. I would, I would, I would worry about that, too, because... Again, I wouldn't worry about it. I am an attorney. A takings clause applies. <laughs> so, you know, it may be one of those things you'd have to worry about. I can't speak for the city on that. It's outside CEQA. Uh, so limits of CEQA, as I mentioned, doesn't approve or deny the project. Uh, EIR doesn't deny a project. Agencies can go ahead and approve projects, even though there may be significant unavoidable impacts. At the same time, they can require mitigation. They can require uh, redesign of the project. They can adopt an alternative instead of the project. Uh, so they have a variety of options there. And then doesn't provide any new powers. The agency has the powers that it has as, as a city or as a regional water board or as the uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control. Each of them has their own set of powers and authorities. CEQA doesn't expand those in any way. It's still subject to con constitutional nexus and fair share, for example. And then, as I mentioned before, program EIR is kind of the foundation for the CEQA analysis, but additional analyses will occur as these other agencies make their approvals. And as time goes by and other approvals are necessary, uh, the program EIR will be the foundation for subsequent EIRs or subsequent mitigated negative declarations, et cetera. So it doesn't, the PEIR uh, doesn't get updated, but at the same time, hopefully it doesn't become outdated because these additional studies will be needed uh, as additional projects come along, or additional activities, I should say, within the project come along. Oh, to have, uh, oh, wraps, huh. uh, remedial action plans. Sorry about that. 
Uh, a city could put, yeah, the question is, could the city put a time limit on their own EIR? And the answer is yes, they could. They could if they so choose. Not many cities do, and CEQA doesn't require it. And there have been court cases where uh, agencies have relied on documents that are 10, 15 years old uh, without, you know, without being sanctioned by the court, being upheld by the court. So, so it depends. Yeah, but it depends on the, on the agency and how they want to handle it. Yeah, City of Modesto, for example, City of Modesto has a master EIR. Uh, they attempt to refresh it or go back and redo it every five years to seven years. Uh, this depends on the agency. Well, you know the it's unusual to do that. The EIR uh, relied on is totally bogus and no good. Or the consultant is just trying to get a different preparative. So what happens if the uh, EIR is totally bogus and no good? Um, that would, that would yeah, have to be... That underlying data. Yeah, that would have to be determined by the court. If the court decertifies the EIR and invalidates the action of the agency, then the agency will have to go back and repair the EIR to the satisfaction of the court. But that would depend on whether, first off, whether there's litigation, and then secondly, whether the litigation is successful. But otherwise, if there's no litigation, the courts have held in the interest of finality that you can't go back and relitigate an EIR uh, if its statute of limitations has run out. Are there any cases that you know about where uh, these EIR consultants have been bribed or corrupted or anything like that? Uh, cases where EIR consultants have been bribed or corrupted? Pff, yeah. got no idea. No idea. Yeah, I don't know how you'd even find out. I, as far as I know, there haven't been any court cases over it. Yeah, but I don't even know how you'd how you'd look. Uh, so uh, public interaction, Vienna, Austria. There we go. Isn't that nice? Yeah, it looks kind of like Brisbane over here, right? <laughs> looks kind of like the downtown area. <laughs> yeah. Farmers market day. Uh huh. Farmers market day. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, much bigger, older city. Uh, so your role, of course, is to offer these project recommend, uh, related recommendations. Um, you know, your committee isn't necessarily going to be the venue for receiving comments on it, but you can certainly make comments on it, and you can decide how you want to do that. Uh, it's generally easier for the city if you put together a consolidated set of comments. So if each member of the committee uh, is reading through it and comes up with their own comments, or if you put together subcommittees and the subcommittees come up with comments in particular areas, putting all of those together into a coherent set of comments is most helpful to the city. Uh, and if you have people in the committee who have different opinions, it'd be kind of nice if you, if you reconciled those in the comments too. Don't necessarily have to, but it makes it easier for the city if you reconcile them. So that you're not, second, city isn't second guess, trying to second guess who meant what and where. And you can still make your comments as a private citizen. Sure. Mm -hmm. No reason why you can't make your own comments as a private citizen as well. Yeah. So, one of, the the committee chair is uh, is was not able to be here tonight, but um, I I had a talk with her not too long ago, and she's and she's kind of thinking how we expect this to be an enormous document, and she's kind of thinking. How do we start, you know, how, how does this committee start um, working through it? I, I mean, how do we approach it, mm -hmm. this, this enormous document? Um, and certainly, it's, you know, the idea of subcommittees is a good one and one that we, we make use of for other purposes as well. Um, perhaps you have some thoughts on, the, on it, on that matter. Yeah, one thing that you can do is to start off with the executive summary. That's what I always do when I'm peer reviewing or otherwise looking at an EIR, because part of what I do is to uh, peer review EIRs that have been done by other consultants as kind of a third party reviewer for agencies. And so uh, I usually start at the executive summary and take a look at the executive summary because it'll give you an idea of what the conclusion, what the, you know, what the issues are, um, what the conclusions are, uh, what mitigation measures have been developed, what the alternatives are, how the alternatives balance against each other. And it'll give you an idea of what seem to be the hot spots in, in the EIR. And you'll get an idea of where you can go to find the issues that are of interest to you. Uh, if, if by one, some means or another the executive summary doesn't have that stuff, then go to the table of contents, look through the table of contents and see wh which issues are yours. Aesthetics, for example, um, potentially uh, uh, recreation might be one that you would look at. Uh, if you're concerned about uh, open spaces for other uses, maybe noise, these other sorts of things, 
um, pick out those, those issues that seem to be of interest to you and jump to those particular chapters and go through those. And as I say, you know, you may want to split them up rather than going through them as a committee and have one person look at one and somebody else look at another or have subcommittees look at different sections. Uh, it's kind of up to you. But that's what I generally do. I generally start with the executive summary. Yeah, because they're, they're pretty big. And one of the things you might look for, too, you know, if, since you're looking, is, is inconsistencies. You know, that's one, one that I didn't mention before, but that's one reason why you would uh, kind of come together at the end to talk about what you found uh, in your individual reviews. Because it may be that as you've been wandering through this, there's some inconsistencies in data, or there's some inconsistencies in conclusions, and those would be things that you'd want to highlight, too, any in inconsistencies you find. OK. Uh, I know that the, the public or and agencies and so on and so forth uh, submit, uh, submit comments, mm -hmm. and then there's the response. Right. The response, basically, right? Um, but I believe that's usually done by staff people and maybe the IR consultants or whatever the preparers are. Um, and yet, it's the city of Brisbane, in this case, that's the lead agency. And they're also for the council, right. who's ultimately responsible. So before those responses go out to the public, or, or the public, does the lead agency actually review those uh, comments and responses to the comments? Yeah, I don't know how the city of Brisbane would decide to, to work that. Typically, you know, yeah. most, most of the agencies that I work for, the, the um, governing body, whether it's a city council, board of supervisors, typically they don't go through those written responses. Typically, they defer all of that to staff, okay, and the staff does. To. But they could if they want to, yeah. And now, one of the things they have to be careful of is that uh, they don't do it, uh, they don't all get together uh, at the pizza parlor uh, and go through it and violate the Brown Act. You know, well, so you don't want yeah. to have that sort of thing. But you know, they, 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 could certainly, you, they could certainly do that if they wish, yeah. Doesn't happen very often. Uh, most agencies don't get that involved. But every so often, I'll run across a client that that has done that, yeah. Okay, a, a, a couple, two more questions that are similar, uh, related. Uh, you talk about the, the objective being important uh, for alternatives uh, analysis. Right. Um, it, again, is it the city council that passes a resolution saying this is the objective of, of this, or is that usually deferred off the staff and GIR consultant as well? Yeah, my experience has been in general, it's done by the, uh, the staff and the ER consultant, but not always. I'm working for a, an agency right now where the, the uh, Board of Supervisors is going is to weigh in on what their objectives are. I'm sure of it. They haven't, haven't said so much yet, but I'm sure that they will, because they've been intimately involved in uh, describing what the project is. Usually the project description is kind of left to the, uh, you know, to the staff and the consultant. In this case, the Board of Supervisors is going to be going through the project description piece by piece. So it really varies between agencies, but they have the flexibility to do either one. Well, actually, I've seen uh, alternative analysis rejected on the, on the claim to ground that it's infeasible because uh, it won't make the real estate speculator any money or it's, it's, it costs too much. Mm -hmm. Now, it's my understanding that that's not appropriate under the but that economics uh, in terms of mitigation and alternatives is really not the way to do the analysis. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. Well, it is and it isn't. Okay. Uh, CEQA doesn't require you to look at the economic impacts of a project or the social impacts of a project unless they relate back to some physical change. So uh, typically, that's been urban decay. If the project would have such an extensive economic impact that it would lead to uh, the decay of an urban area, uh, then that's something that CEQA would look okay. at. Right. So potentially, if it were to end up with empty buildings downtown because of economic competition from the Baylands project, that would be something that the CEQA document would need to look at. But as far as determining uh, feasibility of mitigation or feasibility of alternatives, economics is, is perfectly usable as, as a reason for finding those to be infeasible. Uh, there are court cases galore where, where they've been found, well, actually, most agencies lose. Uh, but th there's been uh, an argument that for one reason or another, the thing is infeasible economically. And the key to the agency making that determination is 
uh, number one, to have an idea of what the project itself is going to cost. That? Oh, you, you don't have to analyze it. This comes at the very end of the process when they're making their findings over the feasibility of the alternatives. Because when the agency is putting well, together... Well, that's not interesting to analyze. That's talking about when they reject it from the analysis. Right. When they originally make the uh, decision to reject something from the analysis, uh, they're not required to make a final determination of its feasibility. They simply have to determine whether it's potentially feasible. feasible. So an agency doesn't necessarily have to... Uh, do a full economic analysis in order to reject a particular alternative. And in most cases, they're not rejecting those alternatives on, on economic grounds. There's usually they don't meet the objectives or uh, they don't reduce the impact. Usually, uh, where the court cases have been anyway, usually the, the issue is rejecting an alternative that was analyzed in the EIR on the argument that it's economically infeasible. The court cases where the agencies have won are the court cases where the agencies actually had economic data that indicated that, yes, indeed, uh, either the thing was um, going to be a lot more expensive, not just a little more expensive than the project, but much more expensive to the project to the tune that it, no rational person would choose to do the alternative, uh, or that they had um, the pro forma from the developer themselves indicating they couldn't make a profit from, from the project if they undertook one of the alternatives. There's a court case down in uh, somewhere in San Joaquin Valley where uh, a uh, rancher, potential dairy rancher, uh, opened up his books and showed that if the alternative of a reduced size dairy were chosen, he simply couldn't make enough money because he, couldn't, he had to have a particular number of cows in order to make the dairy work, and that alternative happened to be substantially below the number of cows that he needed, that he needed to have to actually run the dairy. So the times that the agencies win, they have this documentation that indicates why one of the alternatives that they analyzed in the EIR is actually economically infeasible. So they've basically done some sort of analysis. Exactly. This, right. But that analysis is usually outside of the EIR, but comes into the record at the time that the agency makes its findings on the EIR. What are the kind of cases where the court says you didn't look at enough alternatives? Uh, well, the courts uh, depends on what the alternatives are. If, if, for example, the agency looked at a variety of alternatives, uh, but none of the alternatives met those basic criteria. You know, they, they don't meet the, most of the project objectives. They don't re reduce the project impact. In other words, there are alternatives that wouldn't actually qualify under those three criteria. Then those, the courts have generally said, those aren't real alternatives. We're not going to count them as such. Uh, the courts haven't set any kind of a, I don't know what you call it, any kind of a, a number, you know, minimum number of, of alternatives that you must have or anything like that. They generally take it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on the arguments brought up by the project opponents as to whether or not uh, alternatives that weren't looked at should have been looked at, or whether the, there were other alternatives that were out there that the agency uh, arguably should have looked at and didn't. Uh, but the courts have generally said that there's a rule of reason that they will apply. They don't require that you look at every alternative, but you, they require you to look at a reasonable range of alternatives to the project uh, or to the project location that would satisfy them. And they kind of they kind of know it when they see it. So no strict rule on it. Okay, we're gonna move on. Please you can ask more questions later. Um something yeah. you said sort of struck me. You said that the when responding to John you said that usually the lead agency is typically not that involved. Um and that sort of struck me because through all of this process we've been saying the lead agency is responsible now. How do you reconcile those two things? If they're not typically that involved with the comments and the trust and the documentation and the, you know, the creation of the document and the responding to the comments, I don't understand that. I mean, if you're responsible, doesn't that require involvement? Right, yeah, so when I say the lead agency isn't typically involved, I mean the city council people themselves okay. are not typically involved in the minutiae of putting together the environmental impact report. They are involved in uh, reading the thing, certifying it, that it, certifying that it adequately meets their needs, and if they read through it and decide, you know, we don't think that this is adequate, they can kick it back to staff before they certify it and require that additional things are done. So they still have that, that ability to do that, up until the time they certify it, because it really is their document. But and for the most part, agency, you know, the actual city council people, or if it was the county board of supervisors, they're not going to bore in 
uh, you know, on the draft EIR and attempt to write the, the responses to comments. They generally leave that up to staff and consultants and such. One of the reasons why is that sometimes the responses are technical responses, where you ha may have to go back to your traffic engineer or whoever uh, to get uh, a better idea of what, you know, how you respond to that particular comment. If they could just give us a quick, give me a quick um, rundown on how how much involvement the city had with um, defining the project objectives. Can you give me like a 10-minute answer to that? <laughs> Yeah, probably in 2006, the count, I believe it would be 2006, maybe it was 2007, the city council actually considered a list of project objectives. So those will be in the record and included in the draft EIR. I can get that to you. I don't have that out my fingertips. The objectives? I don't recall that they were. I'd have to double check. But I can certainly get the um, the council report to the to the committee. I would like that. Oh, other question. I'm, I'm coming a little bit later to this process, and I would like the background. Can they add alternative uh, alternative plans to the draft Yeah, so can the city add alternatives after the process has started? Uh, they could add alternatives up to the point that they release the draft EIR. But if they add additional alternatives, I would say, after the draft EIR goes out, they would probably have to recirculate the draft EIR. Right, you'd have to recirculate so that the public, again, and other agencies have an opportunity to look at what those alternatives are, those new alternatives are. So that might be something that would require recirculation. So they would essentially add those to the draft and send out what's essentially a second draft with the new alternatives added. And in fact, you know, an agency could even do that at the final stage, too, if they, you know, for one reason or another, they wanted to, to add alternatives. And occasionally, that will come up during the CEQA process, because during the comments that come in, sometimes people will suggest additional alternatives. And when the agency runs the alternatives through its criteria, do they meet most of the objectives? Are they potentially feasible? Do they reduce impacts? They find that, yes, indeed, this does. And is it a reasonable range? Is it similar to one of the previous alternatives we've already looked at? No, it's not. It's different, and yet it meets all the requirements. That might be one they would have to add to the EIR before they certify it, and that would also mean recirculating the document. So again, it's, it'll be a question that they'll, they'll that could pop up at a later time before they uh, go ahead and certify the EIR. Mm -hmm. discussion of, e of each particular area. Right. Okay. Of, of, of each particular area. So, so, um, in terms of resource analysis, if we, want, if we wanted to say, hey, you know, um, there's a whole lagoon out there and nobody knows what's in it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, an, that's a problem. Um, is that, is that, is that an adequate kind of a comment? In more formal language, or do we do we need to make some do we need to have some more formal um, uh, reference? That's, um, do we? Yeah, I always found that find it helpful when I as my, when I'm working on a document. I always find it helpful if people do have references, not, you not know, or if they're relatively the specific. Document. No, I mean if they have other documents okay. that, that they've looked at and they feel offer some new information or some information that maybe clarifies something or maybe even disagrees with something that's in the EIR. It's useful if you have that information to cite it and actually provide a copy with the comments. And if you can't provide a copy and it's on the web, then provide the, the particular website that you can find it. And when I say website, I mean the location within the website that you can find it. Not just the website itself, but the page, the web page that has that information. So, for example, if the 
EPA has a certain um, recommended um, method of testing groundwater runoff for uh, 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 dumps, uh, for garbage dumps, and that's not being implemented right now. Mm -hmm. That would be, you would, you would go and, and you, you would could this You could make that comment, sure. Okay. Yeah. Now, that may or may not make a difference as far as the EIR goes, because, as I said, CEQA doesn't lay out particular things that you have to do, particular methods. And there may be more than one method to do something. And there may be more than one method um, allowable under acceptable professional practice to do things. So that might offer another way of doing it, but it may not be the only way of doing it. And it could be that the response would be something along those lines. Well, we've undertaken something that's within the professional you know, within uh, uh, you know the, the reasonable range of professional uh, practice, uh, and here's why this particular method that we used is a good method to use, and here's why, although the EPA has that other method, we've chosen not to use it. But that would be what the response would have to be, it would provide something along those lines. They couldn't simply say, uh, we didn't use that one, because we didn't like it. But they'd have to explain why they didn't use it, and why the one that they did use makes sense to use. Ouch. Looks like it was okay. hot. Let's say, let's say, <laughs> okay, let, then let's, let's say um, the draft EIR says this is a, this, this particular mitigation isn't feasible. And we were to come back and say, well, you know, in this particular, in, in, in these other four cases, this was deemed to be a feasible, feasible mitigation, and in fact, it was, it was done. Is that the kind of reference we want? Sure. That would be, that'd be a fine reference. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, as I said, the final ER will make a response to that, okay. and the the city still has the opportunity to say no. You know, we've decided not to include that mitigation, but if they do, they have to explain why they're not. You know, so that's one way of of providing a little more explanation than you might get in the EIR itself as to why that mitigation isn't being used, isn't being adopted, or isn't being included. Yeah, so it seems to me that's fair game. Uh, yes, pass the mic over. Can the courts? mandate that the city um, adopt a certain mitigation, even though the city says it's not feasible for us, can the city be sued on an individual mitigation? Well, the cities can be sued over any part of the EIR. So certainly there may be challenges to mitigation measures. I've, you, you see that in the court cases. Um, they may also um, you know, allege the mitigation measure is inadequate. And so what the court will generally do is they won't say that the city must adopt the mitigation measure, but they'll require that the city provide additional um, justification for why it hasn't in order, to, in order to satisfy the court. So the court will say, you know, here are the shortcomings of the EIR. These are the things we think you need to do in order to fix the EIR. Bring that back to us and show that you've fixed them. But the court, the court can't dictate to the, to the city exactly what it must do as far as the EIR goes, as far as adopting mitigation measure or not. You know, they would, the city might have to do that in order to satisfy what the court says if it turns out that they have no, you know, no justification for getting rid of it, a mitigation measure. But they do have flexibility, generally, under, under these court orders. Yeah. Again, I'm not an attorney, but that's what I've noted in the court cases I've looked at. So I have questions about wanting to understand better what the court is doing in the do the, how does come into play in this document? I mean, yeah, they don't come into play at all in this document. Okay. So that's right. A There's a separate, that's a separate type of environmental document. Right. So if, you're, if you have a project that's in front of the agency, and the agency determines that there's no evidence that the project may have a significant effect, then they would adopt a, a negative declaration. Uh, if, on the other hand, the agency looks at the project and there's evidence that it may have a significant effect, but the agency has mitigation measures that will clearly avoid that impact or reduce it below a level of significance, then they can adopt a mitigated negative declaration. Okay. But if it looks as if there may be a significant effect, and it's not clear that there would be mitigation measures that would bring it below a level of significance, then the agency is required to do an environmental impact report. So in this case, you know, there's a good argument, or fair, what's called a fair argument, that there may be an impact, and so they're doing an EIR. City's doing an EIR. 
Now, as a subsequent document, uh, you know, what, if the project's approved, EIR is certified, uh, let's say some other agency is approving uh, activity on this project, or even the city taking a later action on the project, uh, it will then look at that action to see whether or not it was covered under the original EIR, and whether there's new information or changes in the project, changes in the circumstances that indicate that there's a new impact or a more severe impact. And if it finds that there would be a new or more severe impact, but it can be reduced below a level of significance, then the city adopts a subsequent negative declaration, subsequent mitigated negative declaration. If, on the other hand, it looks as though there's a new or more severe impact, then it would prepare a subsequent EIR or a supplemental EIR, and it would analyze that particular impact or impacts that, that are new or more severe. OK? I have a, uh, one more question, or a couple more questions. On the, on the uh, addendum EIR, there is no public comment. Right. And on the supplemental one, there is, but on the, the one in between. Yeah, the subsequent EIR, right. Yeah. So subsequent EIR, subsequent mitigated negative declaration, supplemental EIR, all of those go through the usual process, just as if you were doing an EIR. Okay. The only thing is you're focusing in on just a relatively relatively few issues okay. and impacts. Then I was wondering also, could you expand a little bit? There's two areas I'm curious about. One is, um, and you may not be able to speak to the specifics, but, and I know you spoke about, you know, the, the the developer sponsored plan, the entertainment variant, the community developed plus a variant, and kind of why they might not have chosen to do the renewable energy one, or can you drill down in that some? And then the other area that I'm curious about was um, you talked about um, the project's effect on the environment, but then could you elaborate, elaborate some distinctions on the environment's on the project. Right. Yeah, so for the first one, I don't know. I don't know the answer why the city decided, you know, what to place particular weights on the alternatives and how deep it goes into the analysis. I just, I don't know. But on the other one, um, the effect of the environment on the project, there's been a line of court cases in Southern California. Uh, and they're, they cited an old case from Contra Costa County several years, from maybe 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and that original case, uh, somebody wanted to put in a, um, I think it was a detox facility, a detox facility um, on property that one time had had uh, some sort of hazardous materials or something like that on it. Uh, the court looked at the, at the uh, challenge to that document. And for one reason or another, the, the court decided that, well, you know, we think, we think that this is a situation of the impact of the environment on the project and not the project on the environment. So even though the site may have been contaminated at one time, because that would be an impact of the environment on the project, uh, we don't think that CEQA applies to that. So we're, we're not going to look at that as being a potential point of challenge in this case. That was a number of years ago. For the most part, um, at least here in Northern California, CEQA practitioners, most of the CEQA attorneys that I've spoken to, kind of discounted that. They said, well, you know, there were some extenuating circumstances in that case. It looked as though it was a pure NIMBY issue, where the affluent neighbors didn't want this um, detox facility to go in, and so therefore they were trying to drum up some reason to oppose it. And perhaps the court, sensing that, decided that they were going to allow this to occur. Uh, so they kind of rationalized it that way. Uh, within the last three or four years, though, there have been a series of cases down in Southern California, starting off with one uh, be a case that was uh, between the LA Unified School District and the city of Long Beach over a new high school, um, where the city um, argued that there was going to be an impact of this new high school, or there was going to be an impact on the new high school because it was near the port of Long Beach. And there's a good deal of rail traffic and truck traffic and those sorts of things that run by there, and there would potentially be uh, hazardous materials that the students would be exposed to. And so the court in that case, oh, sorry about that, the court in that case, uh, said that, well, you know, there's a whole variety of the studies that are necessary before you can cite a school, and those studies um, cover those issues that, that are being raised by the opponents of the project. Uh, and even beyond that, uh, this is an, an impact of the environment on the project, not the project on the environment, and so we're going to kind of discount that issue. 
Uh, so then time went by, and a year or so, and there was another court case in Southern California where it was a um, wastewater treatment plant that was suing the city of Dana Point over a subdivision that was to go in near that wastewater treatment plant. Uh, wastewater treatment plant was arguing that there would be uh, noise and particularly odor impacts uh, from its wastewater operations, treatment operations, on that local nearby subdivision. Uh, the court looked at that one and said, well, you know, that's an impact of the environment on the project, not the project on the environment. And, but many of attorneys uh, kind of rationalized that one away, too, because it appeared as though the uh, wastewater treatment district was attempting to get a couple million dollars or more out of the developer in order to fix existing problems at their plant, existing odor problems at their plant. Um, so that one also was considered to be kind of an outlier. Oh, maybe there were extenuating circumstances, maybe it's a bad case makes bad law type of a thing. But then finally, there was this case down in the um, city of Los Angeles where it was a subdivision, was second phase basically, second phase of a large development project previously been approved. Uh, it was near the coast, but not on the coast. Um, there was an allegation that there would be sea level rise that would potentially adverse, adversely affect the project. Uh, between the draft EIR and the final EIR, uh, the city had uh, an engineer come in who studied the situation. And it turned out that the opponents of the project had been looking at kind of a large scale map prepared by uh, some NGO that indicated that yes, indeed, this, this area might be inundated uh, in the case of sea level rise. When the engineer took a look at it, the civil engineer took a look at it, um, they realized that, you know, actually the site is higher than the sea level rise would be, and the site is two miles from the ocean. So it's pretty unlikely that it would actually be subject to sea level rise. And so that was put into the record. Uh, the, court case, the court looked at it and kind of brushed aside that evidence and said, well, you know, this really comes down to an impact of the environment on the project and not of the project on the environment. And so we're going to dismiss this issue because CEQA doesn't cover the impacts of the environment on the project, but rather just the opposite, project on the environment. And not only that, we think that the CEQA guidelines that are talking about sea level rise and those sorts of things uh, in the Appendix G, which is the environmental checklist, we think those guidelines were enacted incorrectly, that the guidelines don't follow CEQA law. And so it's a, a really powerful decision that's, that's come out of this court. And so, as I say, CEQA practitioners believe that that's going to start popping up in other arguments, not necessarily in other decisions, but people are going to start arguing that. You know, developers are going to start arguing it for sure. And it's already popped up. Uh, it wasn't part of the decision, but it popped up in the arguments uh, against the Air, uh, Bay Area Air Quality Management District's uh, CEQA guidelines that they were attempting to adopt. It was recently overturned for May, April, March, somewhere in that area. Uh, and it was overturned because there was the potential that it was going to um, increase development in the surrounding areas because it would discourage infill. And the court held that adopting those CEQA guidelines required some sort of EIR to be done because the Air District hadn't done an EIR. It was just adopting guidelines. Uh, but one of the issues that the opponents raised, the Building Industry Association raised, was, well, this is an impact of the environment on the project, not the project on the environment, because some of the guidelines talked about toxic air contaminants. So we saw it raised in that case. The Superior Court decided not to decide, decide it on those grounds. But nonetheless, that, that uh, Bayona Wetlands case down in Southern California is starting to bubble up and show even in cases here in Northern California. So that, in a long, a giant nutshell, is the, the whole kit and caboodle of it. So things that could potentially impact our It could potentially be a lots of stuff, and so way. right, and so what? What? Ecology. Yeah, but it's up to the agency to decide what it wants to include, and so practically all the agencies that we deal with, ICF deals with, and I'm sure the city as well, uh, has not been following the Bayona Wetlands decision, and they have continued to look at impacts of the environment on the project as well, because if you took it out to its extreme, well then why look at air quality? Or look at air quality impacts, because those are impacts of the environment on the project. Um, you know, why look at water quality? Why look at uh, groundwater uh, overdraft? 
You know, why look at any of that? So flooding? Why would you look at flooding? It's an impact of the environment on the project. Why not let them build in the middle of uh, a forest, build a subdivision in the middle of a forest that might be subject to wildfires? And that's an impact of, you know, you know it doesn't make sense once you start drawing it out. Okay. So we'll have to see what happens. Uh, there has been some discussion that the legislature may take it up, but uh, you know, they've, they've kind of gone into recess for the next few weeks, and we'll have to see what pops up uh, with the CEQA bills when they come back. Uh, whether or not anything is adopted by the end of the year, we'll have to see. Um, but other than that, we'll just have to watch the court cases and see what the courts have to say, and see whether or not this thing ends up going to the California Supreme Court to try and reconcile it as well. Yeah, so that's where we are. Hopefully I can answer them in less than half an hour, because I'm on a roll now, and I'm just talking, so. Um, I don't really know how to put this particular question. I'm going to try and knit together an example, which I'm sure will undermine what I'm trying to say, because I'll have something wrong. Um, but I just have a lot of, as a citizen of Brisbane, I have a lot of trepidation about how this EIR is coming in at this level of what we know about the project and how many things aren't known and therefore won't be discussed. Mm -hmm. And I have nightmares of like, you know, the developer saying this part is industrial and then we come down the road and find out that by industrial they meant an incinerator. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said, there's probably something wrong with my example, but the subsequent EIRs need substantial evidence to be triggered, which means that essentially it's a higher hurdle you've got to jump over, and I'm wondering if you can in some way speak to how that's going to, how are we protect, protected as citizens and a city? How does that work out? You know, are there things we can do to keep them from sort of like, you know, backdooring us? Is back, being backdoored this way a big problem? It, I mean, it certainly feels like a potential concern to me. Right. Um, yeah, so one of the things that the city or any agency that comes along with a decision on the project will have to do is to determine whether or not the effects that are going to occur as a result of this change in the project were effects that were analyzed in the EIR. So with your example, for example, well, it's supposed to be industrial. Well, now we find out it's an incinerator. So the city or whoever it is that's approving this, this activity uh, would take a look at the EIR. Uh, they would do an air quality analysis of the incinerator. And they would compare the air quality analysis in the EIR and what its findings were with regards to air emissions for you know, all the various uh, agents of uh, whatever the air emissions might be. Compare those to the air quality analysis done for the incinerator and see whether or not they met, match. And if they don't match and the incinerator is high in, on, in some toxic contaminant or if the incinerator is high in some emission, then they're probably going to find that that's a more severe impact than what had originally been identified. And so they will analyze that in this probably supplemental EIR. Let's say this is the only impact. Supplemental EIR, talking about this change in the project, the change in the air quality emissions, uh, whether or not that's significant, mitigation measures for that, and then circulate that just as they would any other EIR and go through the regular EIR process. So that's what they would do. So in 99% of the cases, agencies, in order to protect themselves, have to document why they're de making this determination as to what the subsequent document is going to be. So they typically analyze the project that's being proposed and compare that to the project that had previously been analyzed in the original EIR. Okay? So but nonetheless, you know, citizens, com committees, you, you do need to keep an eye on those sorts of things to make sure that that's what's being done. Okay. So then it sounds like at that point the burden is on the city to prove that this is, a, this is substantially different from what we, as a community, originally understood was the developer's intention. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, I wouldn't call it the burden on the city, but it's the city's responsibility to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, just if you could give us a few words about what we, sh what you're, you know, we've talked a lot about what an EIR is and the P EIR and, and all these things. This is really great information, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to us as the Open Space and Ecology Committee and what you think, what useful advice can you give us in reading through this document? Not just how to attack the document, but how to pick out things, how to address things, how to approach it mentally. Yeah, uh, no, I really, I really can't. Because <laughs> I don't. Yeah, because I, 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 don't know what's in the document. I haven't, okay. haven't seen the document. Well, but you know, you just, as I say, it may be that when, when you look at it, it's, it's pretty big, uh -huh. and it may be that you'll just have to go through and decide what things are important to you. Traffic may not be important to you. Uh, public utilities may not be important to you. So it may be that some of the issues that are covered, some of the resources that are covered are ones that you'll just say, yeah, this is a big document. We don't have time to look at those. And they're not of compelling interest to our committee. So you focus in on the things that, that are of a compelling interest to you uh, and either look at them individually and all get together at the end or break, them, break into subcommittees and look at them and all get together at the end uh, or potentially even turn in individual comments uh, on them. Uh, but I, I can't really guide you too much in how you go about doing that because it's really going to depend on how big the document is and what sorts of things are, are of interest to you, and then applying your experience as committee members as to what sorts of things you've traditionally looked at and what sorts of things are of, of uh, you know, great concern to you. up to the city to decide. Right. Yeah, because as I say, I, I sometimes do peer reviews of, of CEQA documents, and so I assume that there must be some agencies that probably hire other people to do technical peer reviews. So um, and that sort of thing probably isn't outside the bounds of, of possibility. But it depends on what the city wants to do, because the lead agency, they're, they've got the reins. Right. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't say it was stupid, but it would. It could potentially say it was bad for the environment. Uh, I, offhand, I haven't seen one. No. But it doesn't mean they they aren't out there. You know, agencies. You know, agencies could always go about denying a project or approving a project, even if it looks as though it's got all these these bad, you know, bad potential impacts. I always think of the Doberman farm next to the daycare. You know, if you have a Doberman farm, un, unfenced Doberman farm next to the daycare. Uh, even though there's potential impacts, the city, if they do the EIR and adopt the statement of override, could still approve the thing. Uh, how 
Housing under toxic waste dump. Housing under toxic waste dump, right. Blockages. Right. That's kind of stupid. Yeah. Um, but potentially, they could take those sorts of actions if they felt that was what they wanted to do. And as I said, you know, they're going to be, there's still going to be other permits required as well. You, you talked about uh, cumulative impacts a little bit. Uh, it's my understanding you have to look at reasonably, future, reasonably projected future projects for the region. Uh, for example, here, Gated City is planning a big build out along the Geneva Mission Corridor. And San Francisco has a third street in Selma going on, which is you know, growing, mm -hmm. growing and growing. Right. And plus, plus, they also plan to do the baby of Hunter's Point, some kind of huge development there. That all has to be looked at in this document, right? They would need to be considered, sure, included in the cumulative impact analysis. Now, it depends on what the, you know, what the cumulative impact analysis is looking at. Uh, if it's air quality, for example, generally you don't see the, the um, analyses list stuff. You don't see the list approach to cumulative impact analysis used very much in air quality. Uh, traffic, on the other hand, is not unusual at all to see uh, traffic analyses to list all these other projects that are also contributing traffic to the same uh, streets and highway system that, that the project is contributing to. Water, uh, sewer. water, sewer, same thing. It's not unusual to see them use a list approach because there's two approaches you can use to cumulative impact analysis and you can kind of blend the two sometimes as well. One is the plan or projection approach where you've got a, a set of plans or, or plans such as a general plan, air quality a management plan, um, basin plan for the regional water board uh, where you use those to essentially characterize this universe of reasonably foreseeable future projects. Uh, or you can use the list approach where you take uh, basically what's occurring right now is your baseline and for cumulative impacts you add on to that a list of these reasonably foreseeable projects that are, that are out there. And so it could be ones that are uh, contained in capital improvements plans, could be ones that are funded but haven't yet been built, uh, that are road improvements, that sort of thing. Uh, could be uh, development projects that are in the development pipeline, uh, both in your community as well in other cities and surrounding areas that contribute to the same uh, roads or whatever it might be that the project does. And so that would be the list approach. Oh, and then the combined would be kind of in between. Uh, uh, additional energy drain requirements, would that be in there too? Uh, yeah, potentially you'd take a look to see whether or not there was a cumulative impact on, on energy. Now the way the cumulative impact analysis works is that the, essentially the first step is to determine whether or not there is even a cumulative impact within the particular resource ca category. In some resource categories, there may not be any cumulative impact at all. And then if there is a cumulative impact, the next step is to determine whether or not the project is contributing to that. Because if the project isn't contributing to that impact, you're not required to look at it either. So then the third one, third you know, step in the process is, yes, we found a cumulative impact, and yes, the project contributes to it. Now we'll analyze that. And so we'll put together either the plan projection approach or the list approach, and we'll compare our project's contribution to this overall cumulative universe that's out there and determine whether or not our project's contribution is important. And if it is, then we'll try and mitigate it. What about a project, uh, for example, uh, a lot of this toxic waste stuff out there uh, in the Baylands used to be a rail yard. Mm -hmm. and it's my understanding that the uh, California High Speed Rail Authority just got a bunch of money and they're going forward with, with, with that project and that they've been looking at uh, repurposing some of that former rail yard mm. it might be polluted, it's probably polluted, it is polluted, um, for, for their own uh, train yard. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's been out there and discussed in public to some degree. That yeah, right. You didn't, I don't recall. You know, I'm actually working on the high speed rail, but not on this portion. Um, so. I don't know offhand whether that. Yard, no. Yeah, but you could take a look. You could take a look at the EIR that they've done. They've done a couple of program EIRs for the high-speed rail, including um, you know Central Valley, San Francisco, basically Bay Area to Central Valley. And in one of those program EIRs, of which there are two, uh, they probably discuss whether or not they're proposing that. And so that'd be the first place to look. And you can find those. You can find them online. They're online on the. Um, you know, the High Speed Rail Authority's website. Now, recently, you know, the, the uh, legislature approved uh, releasing money from the bonds for high speed rail. One of the th limits on that is that they are not going to allow more than two tracks on the Caltrain line running south from San Francisco. So, originally, the um, high speed rail proposal had been for four tracks 
two tracks for an electrified Caltrain, and then two tracks adjoining for the high-speed rail. That's not going to happen. I think we've got four tracks out there already. Right. That, but whatever's out there is the most that's ever going to happen. They're not going to widen any, any more than that because of the way that the bill was written that the legislature just approved and the governor is probably going to sign. So it might be worthwhile taking a look at the details of that bill as well to see whether or not it affects what's, what's described in the EIR. Because it could be that EIR is actually describing a bigger project than what can actually be built under what the legislature just approved. Look, and then last thing, uh, uh, she mentioned uh, toxic air pollution. At one point, and you mentioned the uh, Bay Area Air Quality mm -hmm. Management Resource Report. At one point, uh, the Bay Area Management uh, Quality District cited uh, the tank farm here in Brisbane as the worst toxic air polluter mm. in the entire Bay Area. Mm -hmm. it was, it was, it, I, I would have thought it would have been Richmond or Venetia, someplace like that, but it's right here in Brisbane, the absolute worst. Mm -hmm. And if they, uh, if they reduce the toxic emissions by half at that time, they'll scrub it, it still would have been at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. So there's a bad, uh, a bad air source up there uh, at the tank farm. Right. Yeah, and that would, I'm, I would guess that would be one of the things they'd look at in the EIR, because it's a certain part of the existing environment. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, in the tape that I watched, you had said that, and I think you said it again tonight, that the lead agency does not have to approve any of the development options. Right. And as long as they outline why. Um, and that it's, it's, what is their exposure in terms of lawsuits? Yeah, I can't, I can't answer that because I'm not an attorney. And, you know, it, it really varies on the, the circumstances of the particular build-up to it, you know, as to what sorts of expectations the, the applicant had, what sort of vested rights they might have. So a variety of different things that, that would potentially come into play. So I, I really don't know. It would be an individual. You know, it's up to the, the judge to decide if, if it went to court. Okay. Yeah, you don't, see, you don't see cities sued very often. At least they don't get to appellate court very often where a city is being sued by an applicant. Uh, and if, if it is, you know, it's generally a situation where the applicant is attempting to get the money out of the city by saying that they had some sort of a right and uh, the city was somehow getting in the way of, getting in the way of this and that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's, you know, it, it's hard to predict. I would like to say thank you again. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we'll have one more chance for another one of these at the end of August. Right. And you will be giving this class for the planning, planning commission. commission. Mm -hmm. So it, it was very informative and very helpful. I think we should take a five minute break and then come back for what will hopefully be a five minute discussion uh, unrelated to sequel. Good. <laughs>
Are we good? Yeah. We're good. No, I'm, I'm also made a suggestion that we might want to uh, just for one week go back to the second Wednesday because um, a couple of people, including Lisa, will be available on that day, not on the second Tuesday. But I just want to clarify, I can I can be available the second Tuesday. So I don't want you to change it because of me. But I thought also you were not going to be available. Right. That Mary is not so, going to be available on the second Tuesday. But, and I didn't have a chance to ask Glenn, so it was just something we thought yeah, we'd... I don't, I don't think it'll be an issue for Glenn. So we, we need to decide what we're going to discuss at the next meeting or we need at our... Um, um, I believe it's expected at the end of August after the Open Space and Ecology Committee's meeting on either date. It, it, it'll be, well, the Planning Commission is going to have their training until the end of August. What, what date is that? Uh, Thursday. 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 Thursday.
and Phil right. Donahueish. Right, so we're not, the plan was to just have the chair approve it because it will go to council before the next meeting. Okay. Anything else? In the crown. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all. We all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you.